Yo. Greetings ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the fourth entry of the Linkara Retrospective. Today we will be covering the fourth and final novel in the Linkara Angel Armor series. As before, if you haven't seen the other three videos, there will be a playlist linked down below. So, with that said, let's jump right back into it, shall we? Angel Armor, Where the Heart Is, is the fourth and final entry in the Angel Armor series, and is published according to Amazon. Oh, it's, uh, it's not on Amazon, or available to buy anywhere else for that matter. Huh. Yeah, in my research, I found that the fourth novel of the Angel Armor series seemed to have had a fair bit of mystery surrounding it. Since unlike the other three books, which you could easily buy a physical or digital copy of, including right now, I found no such trace of this book for sale seemingly anywhere, and finding any info on this last book was even harder than the last three. In fact, if it wasn't for the fact that this final book was on the internet archive, I would have had a difficult time figuring out that this one even existed at all. And so I was determined to find out the answer to this mystery. When was this book actually released where people could actually read it? And why is it seemingly unavailable everywhere despite it being the technically newest of the series? I searched around for a little while and eventually found the answer I was looking for on none other than the Lightbringer.com. While we may not be quite talking about the Lightbringer comic just yet, this last novel is the most relevant to that comic to say the least. And after digging through the website's old Angel Armor slash Lightbringer blog that Lewis posted to fairly often back in the day, I finally found some answers to the mystery around this last book's release. In a blog post uploaded February 13th, 2007, Lewis wrote the following, quote, Book 4, for free! Confused? Most of you should be. But of course, I only like confusion if there are answers for it, and I'm going to give you them all, for one week. See, I can understand that even if fans of the comic like it, they don't necessarily want to shell out $16 for a book that they're not sure if they're going to like. As such, I'm giving you a little sample of Angel Armor. For all the weekend and next week, a special preview of the fourth Angel Armor book will be available for free to be downloaded off of lulu.com. You'll need something to read PDF files, so I hope you're ready. Lightbringer's taking a one-week hiatus until Monday, February 26th. That guy gives you one week to read an explanation on how Lewis got to Pharaoh City, who he is, and how the Dartbringer was created. You get a little deeper insight into its religion, and even some more of the Code Poets. Lightbringer even makes a cameo appearance. This is your chance to get a little bit of a sample of what I have to offer in just writing. No crappy artwork to get in the way. A tee hee. I will note, however, that my editor and cover artist is incapacitated at the moment. So don't try to purchase the actual physical book. There aren't any page numbers yet, and the actual cover pick hasn't been finished. Still, it's not anything that will detract from reading the absolutely free ebook. I do apologize though, since Lulu requires you to log in and provide credit card information, even though it's a friggin' free download. In any case, here you go." Unquote. Sadly, the link leads to, well, nowhere now, and searching for this final book on Lulu's website gives you no results. 
despite the third novel still very much being available to buy there. This seems to have been uh, the first main way to read this novel, and I guess it was also the first and I'm going to assume only way to have actually bought the novel as well. However, sadly, I do tend to wonder if there was ever even a way to buy it at all, physically or digitally. The reason I wonder this is because I still cannot find any trace of being able to actually buy the last book in any kind of physical form. In fact, I've never seen a cover art for it whatsoever, which leads me to believe that there might have never actually been a cover art for this last book, thus meaning that it never officially got a physical release either. Mind you, I could be wrong, and maybe there is a physical edition that is just exceptionally rare, and if you happen to know more information about that and have some pictures to provide regarding that, please let me know. However, back on my theory that I don't think there actually was ever a physical release, the blog post that follows this last one might say something about why that in particular is the case. Quote, Atop the fourth wall. Well, while I was disappointed by the small number of people who took the time to obtain the fourth book, even just downloading it to read it at some later point would have been fine, I'm still happy about the people who did. Kudos to you. Have a cookie. Gives cookie. Still, the fourth book isn't necessary to understand the issue six and seven, but it sure as heck helps. In any case, I just want to promote a new little venture of mine that I'm trying to do. A website that reviews bad comics, going through them step by step and scene by scene and pointing out why they suck. It's called Atop the Fourth Wall and it's located here, atopthefourthwall.blogspot.com, unquote. Indeed, this right here might as well be one of the most iconic posts Lewis has ever written, like looking destiny straight in the face. The birthplace of what would soon become his legacy, as well as the deathbed for the Angel Armor series. Now, while I cannot confirm this information as of yet, so so take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. But my guess is the reason you cannot find this final book available to buy anywhere is because it just simply was never available to buy, never had a physical release. And after this last book came out for free, to all the fanfare of barely anyone reading it or even downloading it at all, Lewis might have been discouraged and just sort of left the last book to kind of rot. I mean, after all, he had his new creative venture of doing Atop the Fourth Wall, and uh, well, I think we all know how much more iconic that series would be and how much more time and creative energy Lewis would be putting into the work of eventually becoming a full-time video creator. However, sadly, this means that the Angel Armor series ended on a whimper, cast aside to be forever forgotten, until some crazy person made a multi-hour video series covering all the novels. You're, uh, welcome, I guess. But, with all that being said, what content lays within the final entry of the Angel Armor series? This quadrilogy left to die. Did it, if nothing else, at least have a satisfying conclusion? Well, let's finally get right into it. Starting once again with yet another introduction, just like the third novel, with more thoughts and insights from the author Lewis himself on the state of the series and his overall feelings. Quote, Here we are once again, on the road to adventure. This is where the heart is, the fourth book in the Angel Armor series. Of course, if you purchase this book, odds are you probably know that already. At the time of writing this introduction, I'm in college and subsequently less of an idiot than I was when I first wrote the previous three books. I still believe they're good, of course, but a lot has changed since then, so I can recognize where I sucked and where I did good stuff. First and foremost, it was almost if absolutely necessary for me to have a chapter where there consisted of a mental battle in some way or another. This was really just an excuse for me to have Lewis fight with imaginary weapons created in animes, TV shows, comic books, and etc. It's not that these scenes were necessarily bad or good, but I did devote a lot of time to them, didn't I? Next, to my shame, I must admit that when I first started writing Angel Armor, I didn't have a backstory or history for the Link Car in Armor. After my first semester in college, however, I come up with one that I believe is fairly original, and I look forward to seeing what you think of it, since this book will reveal the origin of the wondrous weapon that Lewis possesses. This will also be the story where we shall be formally introduced to the Code Poet, along with a slew of other characters. As such, along with the main cast, we already know for Lewis's party, 
I can understand how all of this can be a bit daunting to keep track of. I can only ask that you bear with me and enjoy things as they come along. Now, the reason I mention Ko Poet in particular is because she has already made an appearance in the Angel Armor universe. As if people weren't aware of already, I have a webcomic called Lightbringer that takes place in the same universe as Angel Armor, where Ko Poet made her first appearance at the end of issue 2. Lightbringer will even have a cameo in the book later in order to help foster the idea that this is a universe I'm building. Since so much time passes while I'm writing these books and my developing skills as a writer, there can be some issues relating around time. The first book took place in 2002. However, as time has advanced, there are certain events and real-world actions that happen to shape the universe of Angel Armor. So behold, not 10 years old, and I'm already doing my first retcon. For those unfamiliar with the term retcon, in short, for retroactive continuity, this means that I'm changing some details and facts from the past in order to make this book fit into its current position, as well as possibly altering minor details from the past. The retcon in this case is that the story now takes place in 2007 instead of 2002. That is all on the matter. Perhaps the greatest compliment I've received about both Angel Armor and Lightbringer is not mentioning how good they are, although I really do appreciate it when people tell me it is, but how even if they didn't like the story, they were enticed enough to want to continue reading. Sure, I'd like it more if they actually did like it, but I think it's wonderful that I'm good enough to hook readers for the next installment. Also, I'm just going to say, never sign a contract before reading it. In the third book's introduction, I mentioned how much I dislike pretentious themes in books, attempting to only entertain the reader to the best of my ability. However, after going through college and expanding my reading repertoire, I found myself now unable to stop myself from promoting an ideology. It's mostly because I've seen the value of promoting something in the printed world, especially if it's done in a matter that is subtle. Me? Subtle? Oh boy. In this case, it's the overarching theme of happiness and optimism. In so many ways, I feel that it can feel absolutely pretentious, and I apologize right off the bat if people feel that way about it after reading. This book will also try to explain more of the motivation and ideas behind the darkness, something severely lacking in the previous books. In the first, they were just some vague evil force that vaguely resembled the shadows from Babylon 5, particularly in its discussion with Lewis at the end of the first book. However, while I enjoy villains who are unrepudently evil, some of the best evils are the ones who actually have kind of a point behind them, hence where we can can see a better idea of why exactly Dark Knights aren't supposed to smile. To sum up, this book is actually shorter than my other exploits, perhaps even the shortest of my novels. Considering it's even supposed to be a larger allegory for something else, it'll be interesting to see if anyone can guess what it is, I sincerely hope that people still feel as good a read as any of my other books." Unquote. It is once again quite interesting hearing Lewis reflect on the series as a whole, as well as his lack of planning. And actually what's interesting is in the third book, much of Lewis's thoughts at the beginning of the novel seem to come from a place of what he wants people to see him as, while this one seems to be much more honest with himself and everyone reading for that matter. I find it notably interesting that comments on how many people have noted how they don't like his books, but are usually at least interested in what comes next, which I suppose I could kind of fit into that category. I don't like a lot of the stuff in the books, but they are at least pretty interesting if nothing else. But I find this comment to be rather interesting, especially with how Lewis has been kind of infamously known to not take criticism as well these days. But here, he seemed to have taken it quite well, and perhaps true to his character, remains optimistic and happy that he at least got people's attention, even if they didn't enjoy what they ultimately read. I think it really humanizes Lewis the author a lot more. Once again, he was only a teenager, now a young adult by this point, writing these books to entertain people. And while they may be often quite bad, I feel like it's terribly misguided to hold anything in these books against him personally or creatively for that matter, especially today. This mindset of, well at least they were interested even if they don't like it, once again feels like it was a contributing factor in why this was the last novel, and why this one never went outside of being free through his blog. Because at the end of the day, if no one seems to like them all that much, and now no one's even reading them period, 
I could see it being rather easy to say, why bother anymore? Especially if someone just learning and trying their best, much more success in another creative field. Uh, for Lewis's case, that being videos. Regardless though, I also find the whole ideology comment he makes to be a pretty funny, since we've already established that this has been a thing ever since the first one of his books. I guess he's just being more honest here with himself and saying that, yeah, this is something that he likes doing and that this book will definitely focus on, even noting that this whole book is a allegory for something and wonders if people will guess what it is. A small spoiler, it's going to be pretty similar to themes and stuff to everything else that's been in these books thus far though. But with that said, let's jump into the actual story content of the novel now. There is once again a quick prologue just covering what we already know before we then jump into chapter one, home. So basically this chapter sees Lewis introduce his family to his uh, crew of misfits and we see a few nice and interactions come from the whole thing. However, before that, the group all start out in this old antique shop that the whole journey began in and make their way outside, the store owner telling Lewis that he can keep the golden gauntlet for free and that the store owner refers to him as the Linkara. However, before Lewis has a chance to ask him how he knows he's the Linkara or what his connection to any of this shit is, the whole group see a strange woman outside who is described as, quote, Lewis snapped back to reality and looked down to where the others were standing, before kept their distance away from a single figure lying in the grass, but were close enough to be easily noticed by the frightened individual who was slowly starting to sit up. She appeared to be in her early 20s, but around 5 feet tall in height. She had short blonde hair covered by a red helmet, as well as matching red armor on the rest of her body. There were two rather distinctive features about her, however, that caught everyone's attention right away. The first was the long, fresh scar that had been carved into her face from one corner to the opposite. It didn't appear to be bleeding, but it was quite menacing and appeared to be something that had happened to her recently. The scar was only part of her injury, since the blade indentation in her armor indicated that someone had swiped down from her face through her chest a killing stroke. The second odd thing was the fact that her entire body appeared to be partially transparent. They could see the grass under her, unquote. This, however, is just temporary before this woman fully becomes visible. And while the group go out of their way to help this woman and bring her along with them to Lewis's house, we the audience already know that this strange girl that appeared here before them is none other than Thesia. What she's doing here, well, we'll find out eventually. So the group all head to Lewis's house, and at this point, Lewis has some splaining to do with his parents, John and Erica, wondering who the hell all these people are. Quote, John and Erica Williamson slowly looked from Indo to Lewis and then back to Indo again. They both sat down on the couch of their living room in front of Lewis, whose armor encompassed his body. Body. Endo stood beside him smiling and holding a lightning spell in her hand, small orb illuminating everything in the room. So, what do you think? Lewis inquired, winking at his parents. Both sat with their mouths agape at what they had seen and what they had been told. After arriving back at his home, Lewis waited for his parents to return and promptly explained about the people who were now in their house and why there was a woman unconscious in the guest room. He had left out a significant number of details to his angered parents who were in the middle of chastising Lewis for letting people in their house. While they weren't home when he suddenly brought out his gauntlet and allowed his armor to form around him. Needing a bit more convincing, Endo had been happy enough to show the stunned adults her ears and some of her magics. They were still in awe of the revelation that their son had been in another world for several months, hadn't aged a day from the experience, and the fact that he was the figurehead of the world's largest religion. This is a lot to take in, Lewis, Erica stated. Of course, take all the time you need. However, I hate to say this, but everyone in the group needs accommodations while I figure out how long they'll be here. We intend on going back to Sin. We're just not sure when, Lewis pointed out, looking over at Lithuanar and Jordan. The two in question were amazed at the refrigerator and the fact that it seemed to generate cold air without any magics. Lewis' father raised an eyebrow and looked up at Lewis. You didn't think about how long they'd be staying before you brought them here? Lewis shrugged and replied, Well, kind of got swept up in the excitement of getting back here. 
of this like taking on foreign exchange student? Well, a few exchange students, unquote. There are several little fun, cute moments after this, with many of the characters getting quite the culture shock in this world, and being quite fascinated by all the stuff there within it. Also, Endo and Lewis actually have a couple sweet moments together in this chapter, something which I found to be kind of a nice change of pace. The group also discover what pizza is. Quote, This, my good friends, is pizza. Eat heartily, but try not to take in too much, Lewis said as he opened the Pizza Hut box top up and revealed to them his first example of Earth cuisine. Endo reached for one first, while the others were more reluctant in going for pieces of the food. Jordan in particular was examining the pizza with a skeptical look, making sure she didn't spot any pieces of meat mixed in with the cheese. After Endo grabbed onto a slice of pizza and pulled it away and onto her plate, where she could get a better look at it before she began eating. She leaned in and sniffed at the dish, raising an eyebrow as she looked over at Lewis. It's quite greasy, she commented. Lewis rolled his eyes. Yes, it's supposed to be. Eat up, or it'll get cold. Endo shrugged and raised the triangle-shaped slice to her lips, biting off a piece quickly. She chewed for a few moments and swallowed, proceeding then to quickly gobble down the one slice and start reaching for another. While Lithuanar poked at his slice with a fork, Jordan White raised even ate as calmly as Lewis's parents and his brother, George, who was still trying to wrap his head around the revelation that Lewis had been gone for a year without anyone noticing it, or that any time had passed at all. Needless to say, he was more than a little perplexed by the whole thing. So let me get this straight. I leave you alone for two hours and you manage to not only save the planet, but get a girlfriend and a whole heap of other people to stay at our house? That's just typical. You know that, dork? George commented. Kindly do not refer to my love as dork, Endo said, between finishing one slice of pizza and starting on another. Unquote. Cute. However, it's not all sunshine and roses, as by chapter's end, we see Varric the Destroyer, also make his way to Earth in a pretty cool opening scene for him in this novel. Give me some, damn it! Fuck you, I did all the work! Two muggers argue continuously in the back alley of a downtown St. Paul. With the night came the way the two had to make ends meet, thievery. Both had knives in their hands, ready to stab one another over the wallet and purse they had just stolen off of a couple that had been walking home. However, just before their argument could escalate any further, the alleyway was suddenly encased in light, the two hoodlums in shock over the bright yellow illumination that just filled their alley without any visible source, covered their eyes and dropped the pilfered items. They steadied their weapons as well, wondering if the police had actually managed to track them down or if they had just been lured there by the shouting. The light faded shortly afterwards, returning to its previous ambiance. The two uncovered their eyes and looked down the alley corridor, seeing a man crouching on the ground his body encased in black armor as smoke drifted off of him, as if he had been on fire a few seconds before. The crouching man's body quivered in the darkness, his eyes closed as the two muggers slowly stepped closer to him. Forgoing normal sense in such a situation, curiosity overtook the two muggers as they walked up within reach in distance of the crouching man. Holy mother of... One of them began to exclaim. However, before he could finish his sentence, the crouching man's arm quickly lapsed lashed out and grabbed his leg, pulling tightly to the side and sending the lawbreaker into a nearby brick wall. The other mugger, in shock over how his companion had been flung away like a ragdoll, proceeded to turn around and start running down the alley. Unfortunately for him, the crouching man rose and reached over to grasp the sword hanging on his side. He charged after the mugger and unsheathed his weapon, swiping it across his back. The mugger fell forward, yelping in pain. The crouching man brought his foot down on the mugger's back and kept him pinned down. The Linkara, he whispered. Where is he? Unquote. So yeah, pretty decent, interesting stuff so far. Chapter 2, The Stirring of Wolves. So this chapter is basically about Thesia's backstory being relayed and her sort of becoming part of the gang. The chapter's opening noting, quote, I'm, or rather, I was a conqueror, Thesia stated. After briefly allowing Thesia to relax from the sudden rush of waking up, the assembled group had retreated to the living room, hoping the cushioned sofa 
Sofo would be a better place for their formerly comatose companion. Despite the fact that she was beginning to look more comfortable, the group noticed how she kept bringing her hand towards her face, to the area that Scar had been. White Raven stood nearby, leaning against the wall with her arms crossed. I've heard of you, Thesia. Your only claim to that title is leading a gang of bandits into a city in an air and managing to take it over for a few days before the army retook it, she replied. Thesia smiled and leaned back into the couch. And that was a glorious time, if I do say so myself. No one believed that some simple blonde woman could do such a thing in an air. After all, such gorgeous women were meant to be ladies of pristine quality and refinement. We were meant to be bargaining tools in an air for people to gain social favor. But I knew we were every bit as strong as the men, and I proved it to them. I bested every male those bandits sent against me, and made them swear their allegiance to me. Of course, an air was also suffering from attacks by the darkness at the time, so I admit that the army probably would have struck back against me sooner if they not been busy at the time, unquote. Now, if you're a little confused, so was I. Isn't Thesia supposed to be this evil void lord that has been plotting against the Linkara for the last couple books? Well, yes, but something is a little amiss here, and what exactly it is is hard to explain without simply going through the rest of this book, uh, but keep that thought in the back of your head in mind for now. Meanwhile, Varric is still very much interrogating that random mugger on where the Linkara is. Quote, what is this place? Varric the Destroyer stood upon the roof of a six-story building in downtown St. Paul. He looked down upon the streets. His cape fluttered in the wind. He crossed his arms, examining all the events occurring below him. Varric glared at the people who walked by, his fists clenched in rage. He turned around, remaining in the same pose as he looked at the man tied up on the rooftop ground. The man was one of the two criminals he had assaulted upon arriving on Earth. His body was covered in bruises and cuts as a result of Varric interrogating him earlier. I come from a world known as Sin. Do you know why we refer to it as such? Varric inquired. The mugger remained silent. Varric had half choked him before during the initial interrogation. So his throat remained sore and it hurt for him to speak. I admit most people aren't aware of the legend behind it. Even if they did know it, they wouldn't make the connection right away. To them, the word sin is nothing more than the name of their world. Only well-educated nobles are aware of the negative connotations associated with the word. According to the myth, sin once experienced a great catastrophe as a result of a single person's sinful behavior. As such, the goddess, Mistress Kaus Dragon, decided that the world must forever be encased in a state of sin. So she changed the name of the world, made everyone forget the old name, and replaced it with the new one. Beric walked over to the mugger and crossed his arms as he stared down at him. The mugger responded only by looking up at Beric's face, too weak to even ask what Beric was talking about. Do your gods think so little of your world that they would willingly allow you to wallow in this pit? Popular rumor was the world of the Linkara was an amazing place filled with innovation and a species of thoughtful, wonderful beings that stood on top of it all. And yet all I behold is a landscape that has paved over things bright and lit and covered the remains in a thick layer of grime and filth. This place both disgusts me and entices me. Beric sneered and walked away from the man, back to the edge of the building. Sin leaks out from every crack and crevice, like some dark, murky life giver that drips from the gutters of a small house. I hate to say it, but the darkness would have thrived in a place like this. I can feel every bit of the, I suppose, emptiness would be the appropriate word that comes from this place. The hopelessness of his people are taught from the windows, and I breathe it all in from the air. The darkness would have built quite a following from this place. I embrace the dark willingly, because it has truth 
and meaning to it. But the darkness here is without soul. My god would have given purpose to it." Unquote. Kind of a cool idea that the darkness would have thrived on Earth. It suggests that the darkness is a lot like the devil or Satan, and uh, I just generally find it kind of clever that because of how Earth is, someone like Verit the Destroyer may actually be more powerful here than in the Land of Sin. Also, his dialogue in general just kind of uh, goes pretty hard. It's edgy, yes, very much so, but it's a fun kind of edgy. I can dig it. Anyway, Varric leaves this conversation still unsure of where the Linkara is, but ready to search for him to face him head on. Meanwhile, Thesia is still unsure why she is ultimately here on Earth with the rest of them, but decides that her destiny is unwritten now, and that she might as well make the best of this situation and stay here, hoping that Lewis will be a good teacher for her to teach her the ropes of this new world. Chapter 3, Friends Old and New. So here's where things get extra, uh, interesting as we are then introduced to Lewis's old group of friends from school, of which are presented with descriptions as follows. Quote, Although Lewis was familiar with pretty much everyone in his grade, thanks to spending school with them for seven years, he had a close-knit group of friends that he spent most of his time with out of mutual interest and the fact that they had all been so quirky on their own regards. The one Lewis had known the longest was Alice Bilo, nicknamed the co-poet by the group. She she was the most technology-minded individual of the group, always having a laptop in her hands and coding a program. Sometimes she was writing software for some simple little happy face to wink at a person, while at other times she could be finding new ways to break encryption software. In fact, there had been a rumor going around Hillside High that she had actually managed to hack into the CIA's mainframe. Whenever someone asked her about it, she merely smiled and leaned back not answering. To accompany her nickname, she usually wore black or purple at all times, accompanied by a beret on top of her long brown hair. She only differed from the look when the sun was too bright to wear dark clothes, so she wore all white in those situations." Unquote. Note that the co-poet is actually notable because she actually appears within the Lightbringer comics later on, so yeah. I also once heard from someone that this character is somewhat based off of Lewis's real life mom, but I've never actually seen any actual evidence for this beyond hearsay, so I don't actually know how true this is. But I figure I'd know it all the same in case someone knows more lore about this and is willing to share within the comment section. But uh, yeah. Nonetheless though, kind of a cool character uh, design wise. Nice drip. But, um, back to the group of friends. Quote, Theodore, Ted Sage, was Lewis's best male friend and was nicknamed Shades by the group. This was done for the fact that, due to an eye condition, he had to wear sunglasses most of the time during the day. In the group, he was the most unusual. His knowledge of philosophy was unchallenged by any at the hillside. But what really gained him his popularity among students was his propensity for offering people gum at the most inopportune times. This was part of his offbeat personality, since he would constantly be sending in submissions to the school newspaper, ranting sometimes violently about any little subject and promoting Ayn Rand's objectivist philosophy. But then, be the calmest, most laid-back individual, sometimes to the point of apathy or laziness, when one was actually talking to him. The other male of the group was Trevor Hagen. While they had trouble coming up with a nickname for him, Trevor still had his own quirk that made him unique within the five friends. He rarely was without a book in his hands, and any time he did have one in his possession, he read faster than any thought was humanly possible. He read Gone with the Wind in 17 hours, and comprehended every word of it with ease. The only time he ever had a problem with his speed reading was when he hit a typo or a spelling error. When that happened, he was stuck at a single problem point, unable able to move on until someone either turned the page or pointed him to the next word. The final member of the five was Mandy Chenette. Like Trevor, the group had a hard time coming up with a nickname for her, so she just went by her first name. However, her own unique skills were in the knitting needles. She was constantly working. She had become something of an entrepreneur at Hillside, knitting scarves, shirts, and other various outfits for a nominal fee. She always acted sweet and cheerful around others, and in private, believing that anger, resentment, and other negative emotions need to be bottled up and saved for when they were actually needed. When she happen upon a student who was in the process of stealing a laptop from the technology department, not only did she manage to knock the boy twice 
her petite size onto his back, she kept him there for 10 minutes so she could lecture him about morality and theft. The rumor had been that even after security finally found them and began bringing the boy to the principal's office, he was still ranting at him from across the hall, shouting so he could hear her, unquote. So yeah, that's the Earth Gang of Friends. And while it is a little bit stilted to just introduce them all right here and now like this, they are at least kind of interesting. I don't know how realistic it is for any of these people to be 15 to 16 years old, but um, they at least seem like they have some interesting traits. And they all start having conversations about such interesting topics as, quote, This is so typical. We both get sent down to the principal's office one day, but it's you who gets to become the superhero and save the world. All I get is another worksheet's worth of homework because I ended up late to class, Quiver said behind his book. Lewis rolled his eyes. If I recall correctly, it was you who insisted on writing a class to get on time because you wanted to finish reading that stupid book of short stories. What was it called again? Tonto and the Lone Ranger Boxing Match? This fighter in heaven, not boxing match. And look, I feel bad enough as it is having to read that tripe. I just wanted it over and done with. Trevor replied as he flipped the page of Sense and Sensibility. Ugh, you had to read that thing too? It was like a book version of a Coleman Francis film. Murky, depressing, and confusing as all heck, had groaned. Don't forget racist. It's always nice when you have to read something that constantly talks about how white people are evil. Racist bastards who spend all their time harassing Indians, Lewis stated as his second gauntlet flowed back into the first one. Native Americans, Mandy corrected. Mandy, they call themselves Indians in the book, Ted said as he leaned down from his position in the tree. Doesn't make it right, Mandy said softly. Endo giggled softly to herself and looked at the assembled group. It's amazing how I don't have the slightest idea what you're talking about. It's exhilarating. Now you know how I fell back on sin, Lewis said to Endo, embracing her. Unquote. So... Yeah, uh, we're already getting into talking about random things, like racism and opinions on books and what have you. Which, speaking of, the main highlight of this chapter is when White Raven, Jordan, and Lifmanar learn about the atom bomb and have quite a strong reaction to it, only for Lewis's dad to go on a very, very long rant about the atomic bomb and the general justification for why Japan was nuked. White Raven quickly ran past Lifonar into the bathroom, slamming the door behind her. The former prince blinked and walked over to the bathroom door, knocking on it as he heard the sound of coughing and wheezing. Raven, are you alright? He asked. By the pit, she whispered to herself. Lifonar walked away from the bathroom and over to the living room, where Jordan sat on the couch. She was breathing slowly, her face pale as she stared at the television set. Lifonar looked to the screen, wondering what was causing the unusual behavior of the group. The television had been set up with a TiVo, so the image on the screen was paused so that the two didn't have to watch any further than what it was at the moment. On screen was an image of an atomic bomb explosion. What's that? Lithmanar asked, pointing at the screen. The end result of Lewis's great world. They call it a nuclear weapon. An explosive capable of death and destruction on a scale I doubted possible even for magics kind of weapon that my people have always been terrified of, Jordan responded. John walked in, blinking in confusion. Hey, what's wrong, Fright Raven? He's throwing up in the bathroom. We have beheld your death bringer, Jordan said, pointing at the mushroom cloud on the screen. Ah, I suspect you haven't got anything like that on Sin, do you? John asked. I conceive that there are probably people on my world who are capable of such insanity, but to actually go through with it, Jordan spoke. Insanity? Pardon me, miss, but but nukes aren't insanity, they're a deterrent, John replied. Oh, this looks like fun, Lithmanar laughed, sitting down on the couch. If there's such a deterrent, how come you use them during your world war? Jordan asked, almost yelling at him. They're a deterrent when we use them during the war and after it. If we had invaded Japan, millions more would have died on both sides. And don't assume that they would have surrendered after an initial conflict or such crap. They were utterly devoted to winning no matter the cost of their own country. And once the war was 
over once humanity realized the sheer power of the weapon, the two remaining superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States, never used them against each other. Oh sure, there were threat posturings, arms races, but the fear of mutual annihilation kept both sides from ever firing a nuke at each other, John explained. You stood on the brink of total destruction thanks to these devices, Jordan stated. I sincerely doubt that. The closest it ever came was the Cuban Missile Crisis, and even then, it was settled peacefully. People who claimed that we were constantly on the verge of Armageddon thanks to the nuclear weapons themselves don't understand a damn thing about this world. They assume that it's crazy trigger-happy morons that have their finger at the on the button, that they're going to be responsible for bringing the world to its knees, that if the right people were in charge, everyone would live in a hippie commune without war or starvation. The truth is that the right people are in charge of the world, but the right people don't equal the best world. The weapons themselves are not going to bring about the apocalypse, John stated. And with that, Lewis's father calmly walked away, leaving Jordan grumbling as she sat back down on the couch. I see where Lewis got his tenacity, she grumbled, and his speechifying. Although, he's right, you know, Lithuanar commented smugly. I've been studying the history books. Wars have actually gotten smaller since the invention of this device. More contained. Oh, be silent, Toad. Unquote. So yeah, clearly Lewis has some thoughts about this stuff. And I guess for the actual character of Lewis, we now see where he gets his pension for passionate rants from, though I will admit that, for once, this rant at least does serve some purpose for the narrative, since it makes sense nukes would probably scare people from another world who had never heard of them. After all, they do tend to scare people here who do know about them. It also serves as a decent character moment for all involved. It isn't just Lewis randomly ranting about something that no other character has any context to. So I guess there is at least that as far as an improvement goes. The rest of this chapter then breaks from the established perspective to be from the first person perspective in a journal written by Varric the Destroyer, where basically we hear about his side of things, about how important the darkness was for him, and how ever since the darkness has died, his black hair has slowly been turning lighter and lighter blue like it was when he was born. How this world is yet again very interesting to him, full of disgusting creatures, but also it will make a fertile ground for the darkness should it be able to return, etc, etc. And overall, it is just kind of interesting seeing the perspective of the main villain like this, and not just some random villain that is not important to the rest of the plot, the book, but the actual villain of this book. So once again, a nice improvement. Chapter 4, That's What Girls Do. So this chapter can mostly be summarized as Lewis and co have several conversations about random things. Lewis is interested in and that 15 year olds probably wouldn't be talking about IRL. I guess this kind of makes more sense if you read it from the perspective of like college students, which again is what Lewis was at this point, like the intro noted, but he kind of forgets that. In the actual book, all of these characters are like 15 years old, not college students, but they all talk like college students. So yeah. Quote is exactly the kind of attitude that keeps them down and enforces outdated stereotypes, Trevor stated firmly. Perhaps, but the stereotype is an accurate one, and I speak from experience on this one, Lewis responded. But that doesn't mean that they're all like that. Why are you being so prejudiced against them, Harry queried. Guys, I'm just trying to say why an ethics paper on the oppression faced by zombies isn't going to work, Lewis replied. Lewis, I'm telling you, it's gold. Look at the way zombies are portrayed in movies. They're slow, dim-witted flesh eaters who do nothing but cause a menace to society. Is a xenophobic and deadest point of view, Ted continued. Deadest? Lewis asked. You know, like racist or sexist, but against the dead, Ted explained. Well, not exactly a prejudiced view when it's 100% accurate, Lewis replied, unquote. By the way, there is no context to this. This is where this conversation 
begins and ends. Meanwhile, the girls are having girl conversations. Quote, So this mall is essentially just an indoor marketplace, Endo asked, looking around her at the various shops and stores. I suppose you could say that. So you do have capitalism back on sin, Alice queried. Well, I'm afraid that while I've studied various subjects and fields in my normal teachings and learning, I never really got around to economics. We could very well have it, but I wouldn't know for certain because I don't know what it is. Alice and Mandy took their time teaching Endo various economic models as they moved on from shop to shop, focusing mostly on getting Endo some new clothes to wear. From capitalism to communism to monopolies, they gave Endo a crash course in business and money based on whatever knowledge they retained from the economics classes they had during their first two trimesters. Interspersed through their discussions, they had to somehow convince Endo to try on some new clothing." Unquote. Once again, I find it very interesting that a bunch of 15-year-olds are discussing economics, specifically a different economic models. But uh, you know, whatever. They're doing girl shit, I guess, talking about economics and stuff. Anyway, this talk of Endo trying on new clothes, though, eventually moves into a discussion on women and their role in society and all that sort of stuff. Quote, Why? Mandy stared back at her. What do you mean? Why would you want men to look at you? Endo queried. It was Mandy's turn to be confused. I don't know. I suppose it's because then you can feel appreciated and beautiful because all of those people looking at you in envy and admiration. Endo's brow furrowed slightly as she tried to make sense of what Mandy was saying. But you're already appreciated and beautiful. Why do you need the validation of others on it? Their opinions on your beauty are as irrelevant as their opinions on what color the sky should be. It does not change the true facts of the situation. I'm not some statue to be ogled at. Right on, woman, Alice said with a laugh, distracting the two from their train of thought. Endo looked at Alice and smiled. All right, I will wear this ridiculous outfit, but only if I can wear some other long sleeves shirt over it. I want to at least cover my arms. Deal. Change back into your robes and we'll go pay for the clothes, Alice said, handing the robes back over to Endo. The priestess went back inside the fitting room to get back into her normal clothes. Alice looked to Mandy, who shrugged her shoulders and leaned back against the wall beside Alice. I don't see anything wrong with liking to be looked at, Mandy said. Neither do I, and I suspect Indo doesn't either. She just doesn't come from a place where the mass media creates an irregular standard that people, especially women, are supposed to live up to, Alice explained. Mandy rolled her eyes. Please, you don't buy into the idea that people are that influenced by the media. We've talked about this. People are only influenced by it if they let themselves be influenced by it. People have free will and can make their own choices. Alice smirked. Yeah, but does Endo get that? Unquote. Ah, uh, pretty interesting stuff. I have always enjoyed uh, the constant theme of free will in its existing trumping all other things within Lewis's work. But even more interesting is that in this novel, Lewis seems to have decided to give other characters like his dad or Earth friends his opinions to speak rather than strictly himself or his self-insert. He does kind of make the Earth people feel like strange variations of himself in many ways, but on the other hand, it does allow other characters to speak rather than strictly him having all the opinions and what have you. So I guess I'm kind of 50-50 on it. Anyway, that's when they catch something interesting on the TV while at the mall. Quote, In other news, questions still remain unanswered by the Pharaoh City Police Chief Eddie Crane on the actual relationship the police now share with the costumed vigilante, Lightbringer. The question came about after Chief Crane announced his public support and commitment to working with the superhero in cleaning up the crime rate in the city. While public opinion of the world's first real superhero has been high, many lawmakers and law enforcement personnel are taking offense to Chief Crane's support of what they call a violent law-breaking vigilante. The Pharaoh City Police Commissioner has so far refused to comment on, unquote. That's right, the Lightbringer is a real superhero in the Angel Armor series, and this won't be the last time we see him in this book either. Anyway, the chapter ends with Lewis's brother George realizing that Lewis fucking killed people back on Sin. Hundreds of them, in fact. Something that sort of throws him through a loop when he learns about it through Lithmanar and the like. It's not really expanded upon, but I do find his reaction to at least be kind of funny and realistic given the information. Then the chapter ends with Ferret the Destroyer fucking busting through the doors of the mall 
and telling Lewis that he's gonna beat his ass. Chapter 5, The Way of the World Won. So, Varric comes in to beat Lewis's ass, and then they somehow, like, become invisible to everyone else? I don't really know how this happened. It's like some kind of, like, interdimensional force field that makes it so they can only see each other or something. But regardless, Lewis ends up taking the fight to Varric, who is a magic user and seems quite aggressive. Quote, Who is this guy? He asked himself. How did he get to Earth? Why is he so intent on killing me? Weren't the Dark Knights of Sin happy now? Unquote. So the others decide to head back to Lewis's house as they try to explain what happened to the both of them. Again, it's not that important, but they try to make their way to... Uh, Lewis's house to inform everyone what's going on and then we randomly cut away from this fight scene just as it's about to begin back to Lewis's house where we get this interesting rant about books and John Norman and um I'll just read it out in full real quick quote Luthmanar called back Lewis recommended that I use his laptop to download an ebook to read through to get a better understanding of how Earth views so-called fantasy worlds like sin. Well, it took me a bit of time to understand how to use this curious device. My general searching has come up with several recommendations for both, and I frankly don't feel like trying to read two books. So which should I choose? Lord of the Rings or Tarn's Man of Gore? Neither in my humble opinion, John mumbled from the table as he continued to watch the chess game slowly unfold. You're not going to get either, Eric called as she stomped over to the living room. We have the DVDs to Lord of the Rings movies and you can watch those if you want. And if I see anything related to Gore or John Newman in this house, digital or print, whatever is being viewed on, I'm going to set fire to. With when our blinked and raised an eyebrow in confusion. Why the disliking of the books? According to what I've read, it's a fascinating philosophical read, and I could be able to understand the plot thanks to the fantasy setting. With Menar, that philosophical read is nothing but a misogynistic handbook. There have been philosophers in the world who I have disagreed with. There have been liberal writers who I wanted to have jailed and imprisoned for the kind of garbage they peddle out, and there has been more more than one occasion when I wanted to just shoot myself instead of listen to an idiotic speaker talk. But John Norman, John Norman is heralded by some circles as a fucking philosophical liberator. That crap he wrote. He believes that women are the submissive natural helper, and figuratively speaking, than the slaves of men. His books have women delighted and elated that suddenly they're wearing chains and collars and BDSM and crap. Lithman, I'm not a feminist. I believe that men and women are very different, and that more usually than not, men are better at something than women are, and women are better at something than men are. But the presumption of some science fiction writer to fucking tell me that I'm supposed to be submissive to men and always be happy? Not on your life. On top of that, people actually live their lives according to this guy. Surrendering their freedom to live 24-7 life of servitude to a master. It sickens me to think anyone would ever willingly give up their freedom. It just sickens me, Erica said, shaking her head and going back to her pot pie. Lithmar blinked. So, Lord of the Rings then? People on this planet really like to give speeches on ethics, White Raven stated. Unquote. Yeah, they, uh, they sure fucking do in, uh, Lewis's novels. Very interesting. The topic of women has come up a lot in this book thus far. Their role in society and feminism and, yeah, I don't really have anything else to note on this. I don't even know if Lewis has anything else to note on this, to be honest, but just an observation I made, uh, during this book. Also, this rant has nothing to do with anything, so sadly, we are back to the random rants about things that don't really relate to the characters. It's loosely there, I guess, since Lithmanar was gonna read a book they don't want him to read, but the whole thing just seems kind of random and cartoonish, to be honest, as well. But, uh, random rant aside, the group make it back to Lewis's house and are trying to find out where Varric and Lewis went. Meanwhile, Lewis and Varric fight, and it's actually not too bad? Quote, Each attempt at Lewis's life was countered and avoided, but Varric wasn't showing any sign of irritation from this. Lewis hoped to taunt Varric into making a big mistake, allowing him his chance to dispense with him and have Endo send him back to Sin or get him arrested by the police. Oddly enough, despite the sudden intrusion that Varric had created, the police were nowhere to be seen. However, Lewis didn't give this a second thought at the moment, since his attention was focused on Varric and all the things he was trying 
trying to do to him. Face it, Varric. There's no point to all of this. I'm the guy who beat the darkness in the first place. What makes you think you're gonna be able to beat me? You're swinging like a madman, but all you're hitting is... Varric slammed his fist into Lewis's gut. Lewis hadn't seen it coming at all. The force of the blow completely knocked the wind out of his lungs and sent the pain spiraling through his stomach. Varric swiped with the sword again, but Lewis dodged it narrowly. The edge of his shirt was split by the blade. However, despite dodging the weapon, Varric was suddenly moving faster than he had before, allowing him to go up and punch Lewis across the face. Lewis felt a tooth come loose in the punch as he collapsed to his side, once again barely avoiding a blade that came to his head. He rolled over to the side, but Varric used the aqua to kick Lewis in the back, sending him rolling away and into a brick wall. You killed the darkness, didn't you? Varric growled. Lewis got up and fought off the pain that was irritating him. His armor began to form on his body, but it was still far too slow. Varric came up and slammed the hilt of his sword against Lewis's forehead, knocking him backwards. Varric slashed across Lewis's stomach, this time drawing blood from the Linkara. Lewis was dumbfounded by this sudden change of events. How did Varric moved so quickly. A moment ago, he was just a big brute force that couldn't swing fast enough to chop a tree. Much less at him, it was then that Lewis realized it. Varric had been testing him, seeing how fast he could go before he tried to really assault him. Seeing the need to pick it up a notch, Lewis summoned his wings from his back and jumped up to see what he could do from the skies. However, Varric quickly lashed his arms around Lewis's legs, holding him back from flapping up and out of his range. Varric snarled and pulled a small dagger from his gauntlet, taking the blade and jamming it into Lewis's leg. Lewis yelped in pain as Varric dug the weapon into his flesh, not even smiling at this small victory. All Lewis could see in his attacker's eyes was pure, unbridled rage. Varric pulled Lewis down and threw him by his legs over to a brick wall, smashing his back against it. Lewis yelled from the pain that went through his spine as he fell to the ground, his wings melting into his back. Varric slowly walked towards Lewis, his blade dragging across the ground. Little boy murdered the only thing that ever cared about me, that actually gave me purpose and solace during the times when all hope had been destroyed. How does it feel, boy? How does it feel to be as helpless as my god when you slaughtered him? Varric's voice was cold and unsympathetic to Lewis, whose breaths were becoming quite pained. He looked up at Varric, blood seeping down from his mouth. You really think you're going to defeat me by taunting me, you pasty son of a bitch? Lewis coughed. No, I'll defeat you and bring justice for the darkness like this. Varric proceeded to kick Lewis in the stomach again, causing Lewis to spit blood from his mouth as he gasped for air, unquote. Whoa, boys and girls, is, uh, is Varric an actual threat? Why, yes, yes, he actually is. In fact, Lewis gets his ass completely and utterly handed to him by Varric, and Varric is about to kill Lewis by this chapter's end, until Indo is able to find their location and saves Lewis just in the nick of time by using magic down on Varric, in which he decides it's probably best to leave now and finish the Linkara off later. Quote, Endo landed alongside Lewis, who merely laid upon the ground, tears flowing from his eyes and mixing with his blood as he sobbed openly from his pain. He slowly looked to Endo, who took him in her arms and wept alongside him, horrified to see him in his state of total defeat, unquote. Oh my fucking god. Finally, this cocky piece of shit gets what he fucking deserves. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. When I first read this chapter, not only was I actually impressed Lewis, the author, had managed to have a villain be competent in an actual threat for once, but I was also so happy that Lewis, the character, had finally lost. We are four books in, and it only took till now for Lewis to finally have a significant defeat, unless you count him losing his hair in the second book, but I really don't since he recovered from that almost instantly. I have been so tired of Lewis complaining, acting cocky constantly before breaking down and crying the moment anyone tries to ever make a good point that something he may be doing is crazy or dumb. Him stupidly comparing himself to Shinji Giacari, and how much better he is than him at the same time. Him going on crazy rants to people and always winning every single argument he ever
ever makes with any character he ever talks to about any topic. Being a bitchy brat over eating fucking soup when, or people not getting his dumbass jokes and being a negative little prick and then the moment another character shows any kind of negativity or a moment of weakness or emotion, he tells them to shut the fuck up, kill themselves, berates them, or gets on his opportunistic high horse and act like he never has moments of weakness and is suddenly a pillar of pure optimism. Being a constant Gary Stu with no threats that are capable of even touching him and then by the end of the third novel leaving a whole city and a little girl on their own under the power of an evil king and queen killing and abusing children in his name no less and simply decided to be selfish again and doing nothing about it because he would rather just go back home to earth than deal with any of that. Lewis is a fucking psychotic piece of shit and I guess that if nothing else has made him a very interesting character to follow but on the other hand it makes me actually root for him to be humbled, to make a mistake, to actually have to try for once because it also kind of has made him a boring and eventually very annoying character. <clears throat> So, in other words, sick. Lewis has an actual threat this time. Varric punted his bratty little ass, and now he's gonna have to actually try. But let's see how the rest of the story progresses and see if this development continues to go on and be interesting, or if it is all quickly thrown away. Chapter six, the dark things that hurt me. So, the long and short of it is this chapter sees Lewis licking his wounds and cries about, um, well, losing. Meanwhile, Varric recruits a random mugger from before. Remember the guy he was like interrogating when he first came here? Who like really wants to join in and become an evil dark knight just like him, which Varric ends up doing just that and ends up knighting him and dubs him Darkbringer. Going into a little more detail, Lewis actually actually ends up relating his feelings to Thesia of uh, all people. Quote, How are you feeling? Lewis took a step forward and descended himself down by his knees, enough so he could slam his gauntlet-covered right fist into a rock. As soon as he hit the rock, the rock cracked and exploded into powder and smaller pieces. Lewis's hand continued to hit the grass beneath it. Thesia jumped back a little and gasped at this, not expecting the maneuver. Lewis remained where he was as he closed his eyes. He spoke softly. With this gauntlet, I can crush a rock with my fist. The others were so impressed by it, and I loved it. I can smash through a building. I can fly through the air. And I can defeat big blobs of evil by plying myself into them. Lewis quickly got up and turned around to face Thesia, opening his eyes. But got my ass handed to me by some dark knight. A dark fucking knight! He stopped for a moment and giggled, closing his eyes. <laughs> it's weird. You know, when I started trying to get to, to Eigel, I find a way back here. I tried to stop swearing so much, but now that I'm back on Earth, I've been swearing up a- Ah! Lewis collapsed to his knees, and his smile disappeared. Tears flowing down from his eyes, and he sobbed, his hands going over to cover his face. Deezy looked around and bit her lower lip. He wasn't exactly sure what she was supposed to do. If she had seen someone crying back before, she had been killed. She would have either ignored them or stabbed them for their weakness. Now, however, she was reforming herself, and she didn't have the slightest clue what to do with the boy. He beat me, Thesia. He beat me! He cried. Thesia winced and approached Lewis. The only thing she could think to offer comfort was put her hand on his shoulder, unquote. Sick, cry some more. Basically, Lewis has a big temper tantrum over losing. Meanwhile, as Noah before, Mugger gets knighted by Ferric. Quote, so not only are the criminals in this world poor at their skills, but they are also fools. No wonder this world is so corrupted by its own light and hubris, Beric sneered. Since you don't know anything about me, I'm gonna let that slide. I'm gonna be honest, Destroyer. You scared the shit out of me when you killed Jason, and I was hoping I'd never see you again. But a few hours later, I started to realize that the things you did what you were capable of and where you came from well it was all like something out of a sci-fi movie and I'm not going to be sitting on the side watching it all I want to be on the action 
the mugger stated. There is no action to be had. I am here to kill my enemy and anyone who stands in my way or annoys me. Varric replied. The mugger stopped leaning against the door and held up his hands in a surrender gesture. Whoa, whoa, don't kill me until you've heard my pitch. I've been following you, destroyer, ever since you first beat the shit out of me and killed my partner while you were out and hunted for Linkara. I snuck in here and took a look at your little book. At first it was a blur to me, but I was able to read it within a few seconds. I even took a peek through your journals, which is how I know your name. My patience and my irritation are quickly rising. Make your point, Varric growled. After you kill the Lankara, what are you planning on doing? The mugger asked. Return to sin, Varric yelled his answer. And, the mugger further questioned, wanting to know more. And, Varric paused. And, I don't know. My thoughts are only for revenge against the false idol. Then allow me to offer you an alternative. You wrote in your journal that the darkness would have thrived in this place. Why couldn't it? Why bother with simple revenge against the Linkara? Why not instead humiliate him, shatter the faith he has in his own religion, and bring new life to the darkness here? The mugger suggested, unquote. I don't know who the fuck this random mugger is, but I really like him. Talk about total fucking evil maxing. But uh, Varric seems to agree and then ends up dark knighting him and he becomes the dark bringer and now has some dark knight magic and what have you meaning that there is now two dangerous threats that lewis and his gang will have to face chapter seven the night when stacy died so this chapter is kind of like nothing but people talking about random stuff for a while i mean i suppose it is kind of significant in that the character lewis the linkara ends up going on a rant about what else but comic books which you know is pretty interesting to say the least. It unfortunately is kind of like not all that interesting and doesn't really amount to anything other than just another random discussion about Silver Age comics and general comic book history, which I won't bore you with, but this last little note on the topic I did find to be quite funny. Quote, Endo, I won't let it happen. You hear me? You and me are going to be side by side, and we're going to take on Varric, and he's going to regret ever having signed on with the darkness to begin with. And you know what? It's not just the two of us either. Jordan and Lithy and White Raven. Hell, even Thesia will be standing with us, and we won't let anything happen. I promise you, kitten. Lewis reassured her. <laughs> Unquote. <laughs> Don't worry, my Discord kitten. All shall be okay. Your Rizzler has your back. Chapter 8 plus 9. Missing Things 1 plus 2. So I would go into more detail over these two chapters, but basically this whole chapter, or two chapters rather, is like a big Sailor Moon fight where the Darkbringer summons a monster somewhat based on Missing No from Pokemon, and the whole group have to fight it. It's pretty cool, and admittingly, I have no real problems with these chapters at all. It's not bad. It's just nothing at all narratively interesting happens here for us to discuss. It's just one really long fight scene, essentially. And we've, you know, got to summarize this at least a little bit where we can, so moving on. By these two chapters end, after they've defeated the missing no-inspired monster, uh, the group then ends up having to fight Varric and the Darkbringer. Leading into... Chapter 10, The Way of the World 2. Remember how the first book that the chapters that were in parts like these meant the Endo was going to be, well, sexually assaulted, and in the second book it meant White Raven was going to, I don't know, do something fucking stupid? Well, in this book, chapters with this title means Lewis is going to be, uh, violently assaulted by Varric, which is a good way of summarizing this chapter. But going into more detail, something I do want to take the time to note is the way fight scenes are written in this book are actually a fair bit better than in the other books. They still can be rather stilted, mind you, so I'm by no means saying this shit is, like, actually super great, but it's amazing how much having an actual threat mixed with slightly better prose can make all the difference in the world. Quote, Happiness is a crutch. When one has joy, it pacifies them into only attempting to be at ease. There's no patriotism, no sacrifice, nothing that will make someone stand up 
and do what needs to be done, Varric growled. Varric charged in and swung his sword towards Lewis's side. Lewis spun himself to face the oncoming sword and blocked with both of his blades, trying to force the sword back against Varric. And no pride, no pleasure out of what one does. A life of happiness is just emptiness. Even through all the terrible things I've experienced, I know that I had fun through most of it, and nothing can take that away from me. Lewis responded as his blade scraped against Varric's sword. Lewis jumped up and away from the sword, allowing Varric's swing to continue and throw him off balance. While he didn't get close enough to make a deep cut, he did slice his blade across Varric's face, cutting skin deep. Varric brought his hand up to feel the bleeding cut as Lewis landed, spinning the face of Varric and grinning widely. Varric narrowed his eyes as his opponent. Ah, there it is. The moral decay of your world seeping through. I had heard such wondrous things about your world, Linkara, but I can see it for what it really is. You speak of fun. If an event is painful or tragic for people, there's no fun in that. You've enjoyed yourself. You enjoyed stripping the Dark Knights of everything they believed in. There is the truth of it. Linkara, your world takes joy from pain and torment. You're sadistic, every single one of you. Lewis was about to respond when Varric quickly plowed his shoulder into Lewis's chest, forcing him to the ground. Varric got on top of him and slammed his fist against Lewis's face twice as he struggled to force him off. Varric finally got off on his own power, but kicked Lewis in the stomach twice hard, the electrical surge actually lessening each time he hit him." Unquote. So Lewis continues to fight Varric, while the others fight the mugger-turned-dark knight Dartbringer, and it seems that he is quite the fearsome foe, actually. Lewis and Varric continue to debate the philosophies, and they pound into each other, Varric, however, clearly having the advantage of simply just being a more skilled fighter than Lewis. He also seems to like distracting Lewis with these debate points, and then punching him in the heat of the debate, which is actually kind of clever. Lewis has to win every argument, and Varric knows this, and is using this to his advantage. By the battle's end, Varric once again defeats Lewis, however, having clearly gotten inside Lewis's head at this point and overpowering him physically. However, just as the Darkbringer suggested, Varric takes this opportunity to demoralize, humiliate, and truly put the Great Linkara in his place. Quote, Lewis coughed up some blood and glared at Varric. And you killed anyone who disagreed with you. Your Linkaran order had already declared war a millennium ago when your seer foretold of the darkness's coming. On top of that, your existence is an evil one that would never have been stopped being blinded by light and trying to destroy us. That's the truth. You know that. You surround yourself in light, hoping its radiance will blind you from the pit you've dug for yourselves. Darkness is the world's natural state. Anything else is a perversion. Varric brought his foot down onto Lewis's chest, who was surprised the electrical defense of his armor was not blasting into the metal greaves. Varric lifted his sword over his head. And if it had not been for your... Vile treachery attacking the darkness when you were an honored guest. The war would have been won by him, Linkara. The darkness was right and proved his righteousness by continual victory in battle. And now I give you another example of our might so that you may one day realize your folly. Varric brought his sword down right on Lewis's left shoulder, cutting straight through and removing the arm completely. Lewis's body lurched up and no sound came out of his throat as his eyes widened. The armored parts of it vanished in a puff of smoke, and Varric got off of Lewis's chest, aiming his hand down at the dismembered limb and firing a blast of black energy down on it. The arm vaporized within two seconds, and Varric merely floated into the air. Consider your convictions, Linkara, and see if they are as strong now as they were before he spoke. He called to the Darkbringer, who was still clashing with Endo. The two had been having an exchange of magic attacks, usually small things like fireballs or dark bolts, but as soon as Varric called to him, the Darkbringer stood, bowed to Endo, and jumped up to meet his lord. He swung onto anything he could find, using complex agility and leaping. 
the post of flying as Varric did. Indo chose not to pursue, levitating up to Lewis and gasping as she saw the blood exiting his shoulder. She landed on the roof and ran to him, already beginning to cast a spell to heal up the injury. She looked around for his arm, hoping she could reattach it, but she winced as she didn't see it. As such, she focused her attentions on sealing the injury directly. Lewis slowly turned his head to where his left shoulder had been, his body shivering as beads of sweat rolled down his forehead. His armor was beginning to shrink and revert back into the gauntlet, melting away. As it was a candle left in the hot sun, Lewis's pupils shrunk quickly. If it not had not been for the fact he was still in the magic subdimension, his scream would have been heard miles away." Unquote. And that's how that chapter ends. The villains taking another big W, and Lewis having lost one of his arms. Shit's uh, gotten pretty real at this point. Chapter 11 back through the looking glass. So this chapter is, like, not important at all. It's a chapter that takes place three months into the past, back into the world of Sin, and follows Garrick, again Endo's dad, basically finding out what the last piece of the Linkara prophecy had said. And it seems to have said that the Linkara would destroy the world in the end, which is pretty interesting and ominous stuff, I suppose. But sadly, as you'll see, this plot thread ultimately goes nowhere and gets left behind. So, I'm moving on. Chapter 12, The Break 1. Quote, Alice, Ted, Trevor and Mandy slowly walked into Lewis's house, not wanting to rush in despite the rain that was falling around them. Luthmanar led them into the kitchen, where everyone else except Lewis had been gathered. Most of the group was standing, their bodies leaning against counters or walls. One exception was Erica, who sat at the table, her head in her arms and lightly sobbed. The other was Indo, who also sat but was not crying. Alice was the first to ask the question that the four were wondering. What happened to him? Luthmanar frowned and looked over to them. We, we encountered Varric and engaged him in battle. He had an accomplice who kept the rest of us distracted, and some powerful magics I haven't seen before, Bezia interrupted, rubbing her sore arms. Her muscles ached as a result of battling the blackened tentacles that had grabbed her when she attempted to help Lewis. She had fought them valiantly, but they kept her engaged throughout Lewis's entire match with the Dark Knight. Lewis took on Varric himself again, and he seemed to be doing well at first. White Raven explained. Just tell us what he did to him already, Ted demanded to know. He, oh god. Erica tried to speak, but could only cry loudly into her arms. George embraced his mother, trying to calm her down. Varric cut off his left arm, Jordan stated, closing her eyes. The four's eyes went wide, taking in the news. They exchanged a few glances with one another and took in some deep breaths, their eyes shifting around a little as their minds comprehended the simple six words that Jordan had said to them. Where is he now? Trevor queried. Can we see him? Alice asked. Upstairs. But he won't see you. He went straight to his room and won't see anyone, Luthmanar answered. Mandy looked over to Indo, her eyes shadowed by her long hair. She hadn't spoken a single word since the group had returned to Lewis's house. Unquote. So clearly everyone is quite upset and scared at this point. Lewis has been defeated and for once there is an actual serious consequence. One that both his RPG party and family and Earth friends all can clearly see and begin to cry and panic over, everyone reacting in their own way. And to Lewis, the author's credit, this whole scene is actually, unironically, really well done. And it's all really well done because then when everything is already bad and everyone's already feeling terrible, everything then proceeds to get actively worse as everyone's emotions start to reach their peak and they all begin turning on each other, the conflicting personalities, worldviews, etc., finally all coming to a head, now that their brave leader, who would solve all their conflicts and issues for them, has been so thoroughly thrashed. Desia stepped up in front of Indo, glaring back at Mandy. Doesn't work that way. If we still had the arm, we could reattach it, but Varric knew that. He destroyed the arm after he severed it. Magic is not some omnipotent force capable of anything. It is a science and a tool to be utilized like the technology of this world. Fat load of good it did with Varric, Mandy yelled back. Who was helping Varric? Why weren't you able to just plow through him and help Lewis in his fight? Trevor asked. That's what I'd like to know, Lewis's father asked, walking up to the kitchen counter towards Thesia. The only reason we even let Lewis out of the house was because we figured he'd be safe having all of you around him. Where the hell were you when he needed you? Jordan stepped in between John and Thesia. We were fighting for our own lives as well, you know. Even despite this, 
Lewis shall arise stronger than before. He has the heart and spirit of a warrior unlike no other, and I know he shall plunge his blade through the heart of a, the monster who did this to him. And again, there's that accusation that my son is a killer. I don't know what kind of fucked up planet you come from, lady, but here on Earth, we don't send teenagers to fight and kill in war, John yelled. White Raven tried to pacify the growing conflict. Let's try not to argue here. What we need to do is help Lewis. You didn't do a damn thing to help him when he needed you. He's not going out again to deal with the monster you brought with you when you came from that planet of yours, Doris stated, almost growling at them. That planet of ours? Excuse me, but that's the place I call home, you know, with Menar injected. Head smirked and pulled out a piece of gum from his pocket. Yeah, a fancy land of magics that aren't helpful. People who send children off to fight and die in war, and people who send judgment of those around them. Gum? Varric was right, Endo had spoken softly. When everyone had heard her, they all looked to the one Lewis had been closest to since he had come back to Earth, despite his desire to be with his family again. The Inako priestess stood, her fists clenched, as she slowly looked from one member of Lewis's Earthborn friends and family to the next. I could hear everything he said to Lewis as he defeated him. Maybe that's why I couldn't fight back his accomplice. I was distracted by the words. The problem is that everything he spoke was the truth. In many ways, I knew it before I even came here. Lewis mentioned the terrible things that had happened here in history, but he focused so much on telling all the glories and wonders of Earth that I ignored them. But I understand it now. The moral decay of this world is mind-numbing, and I've been seeing it firsthand since I got here. I have seen it in the way your people view themselves. She spoke, looking to Mandy. I've seen it in the way you destroy yourselves with your weapons that are more devastating than any spell I'm aware of, White Raven said, glaring at John. You said it yourself, Mrs. Williamson. There are people who surrender themselves to philosophies that destroy their value as human beings and their freedom, with Manar stated, looking at Erica, who had stopped crying, but looked sullen at the events unfolding before her. Endo cleared away the hair from her eyes, showing their bloodshot state so they could tell she had been crying just quietly. This is the perfect spot for the darkness. People have become so mired in their ambiguities and self-defeat that they can no longer see any way to right themselves. If the darkness began to offer freedom from that, people would line up from city to city trying to get what it offered to them. And the worst part is that no one would stand up and say, this is wrong. I must do everything I can to bring down this evil because you have forgotten that there is evil in the world that must be opposed. The potential is there for greatness, but it is wasted. Earth is in a dark age. Only if people like you make it into one, Ted yelled, pointing at Indo and glaring at her. I listened to you people sit there in judgment of us, and now it's time you had a little bit of it yourself. Oh, this should be good, Desia laughed, sitting down in what had been Endo's chair. Of course, the world is imperfect. It's harsh, it's unfair, and it hurts sometimes. Do you know what you do when you realize the world doesn't make sense? You force it to make sense. You suck down those cynic thoughts that you're spewing at us, and you tell yourself, it's going to be better because I'm not going to let it get any worse, Ted spoke. Your optimism is misplaced, boy, Jordan stated, crossing her arms. Oh, is it? It's not optimism, you thug, and don't glare at me like you're doing now. It's exactly what you are. You're from a culture based around the honor of beating other people senseless. When Lewis first told me about you and keen society, I was almost elated. At last, a people who understood individual freedom to the point where people knew the need for life and aspiration for one person who understood that selfishness is about being concerned for yourself, not the negative connotation of being a greedy asshole. But now I can see your way is only achieved by destruction, Ted said. Arrogant toad, I should cleave you in half, Jordan growled, pulling her axe from her back. Oh, we haven't even begun, Quiver stated as he moved forward, deciding to step up and offer his own opinions. And what have you for us then, Lithuanar asked. Only that I don't see anyone here from Sin who has any right to judge me or the society that I grew up in. I think Ted goes a little wacko when he's in rand mode, but at least he knows where he stands, Trevor replied. Manny nodded and crossed her arms. Trevor's right. Look at you people. You talk about how we're mired in ambiguity in gray areas, yet... I'm not seeing anything better on your end. The murderers who can't decide what to do with their lives. The prince who pretends to be a thief 
the priestess who SHUT UP! EVERYONE, SHUT UP! Unquote. I'm a sucker for scenes where characters break down and we see shit get real. And this argument feels both fairly realistic from the perspective of all these characters struggling and all having feelings and fears at this point, especially since it's likely Varric will eventually come and kill them all eventually, and the fact that they all are very opinionated and have lots of thoughts about lots of various things. But I was also surprised that the rants both semi-relevant to the world and what seemed to be kind of not relevant, all came back here strangely enough. Meaning that all the crazy rants that were said earlier were actually completely relevant to the plot and the later conflict. Meaning Lewis, for once, made the crazy rants important. And this all leads to Lewis, the one-armed, once-cocky hero, yelling at, well, everyone, and having a total mental breakdown in front of everyone. Quote, everyone turned their heads towards the kitchen entranceway and the hallway that connected with the front door. Lewis stood against the doorway, glaring at them as he walked towards them. No, my love, it's time I spoke my mind. The truth is hurtful, I know, but you need to understand the true nature of your world. Endo tried to say. Lewis gripped his head with his remaining hand, his eye clenched tightly, shut as he took in deep breaths. Just shut up! I've heard everything you've been arguing about, and I can't take it anymore. I feel like I could rip you all apart if I wanted to. I hate you all. I hate all you fuckers and your damn pessimism, and I just can't take it all anymore. My arm's gone and my armor's not coming out of my right, and, and... He began stuttering as he gripped his hair. Alice moved towards him, reaching for his arm. Lewis, maybe you should head back to bed. We need to... Lewis brought his arm away and sneered at her, his teeth grinding together as he looked back at her. No! It's all too much. I... I can't think. I... My love, he's right, Endo said. Lewis growled and looked back at Endo. Oh, go to hell, you stupid bitch! The group gasped. The blood from Endo's face drained away, leaving it to appear paler than before. She lipped the words, What did you say? But did not speak them loudly. How dare you lecture me or anyone else about Earth and morality! Little miss, I'm going to strip and whore myself out! is going to give me a debate on ethics? Lewis roared, his eyes twitching. That's enough, kid, Luthmanar yelled, getting between Endo and Lewis. Oh, suddenly, the fucking thief is going to play hero. You're even worse, you know that? At least Endo can justify herself by saying she was trying to help me, but you, you're just a greedy coward who ran away from home because mommy and daddy were mean to you and your girlfriend, Lewis yelled. Lithwinar swung his fist and punched Lewis across the face, sending him back against the wall. Lithwinar was fuming, barely holding himself back from pummeling Lewis. White Raven approached and put her arm on his shoulder, trying to calm him down. We all need to lower our tempers for a moment, all right? Lewis is just tired from what happened, she spoke. Oh, I'm very much awake and energized, and I have a good deal more to say, especially about you, Raven, Lewis said, rubbing his chin. That's enough, Lewis. Go to bed right now, Erica commanded. Lewis just leaned himself against the wall and laughed. Or what? You'll take away my computer? You can't even order me around anymore, you know that? You've been treating me different ever since I came back from Sin, like I'm more mature or something. And the truth is, I'm not a kid anymore. I haven't been ever since I first killed a Dark Knight, and I'm glad I'm not. I'm not some whimpering child anymore. I'm... I'm... Lewis took in deep breaths and winced in pain. He looked down at his armless left side. He quickly turned away and opened up the closet door, grabbing a trench coat. He began slipping it on as he ran out of the house, and the others trying to follow after him. They called out his name, but he merely kept running as the rain soaked around him, the heavy drops obscuring him once he got far away. The group stood in the foyer of Lewis's home, slowly looking to one another. Endo stepped up to the front and walked to the front door, grabbing another coat from the closet and moving out. I, I need some time to think on my own. He spoke softly, no one trying to argue. White Raven and Thesia looked to one another and moved towards the door as well. We need to try to hunt down Varric on our own. He's probably stationary now because of the rain. It may be helpful, White Raven explained as she ran out, Thesia following behind. The rest looked to Jordan and Lithmanar, who merely stood and blinked, not making a move towards the door. What are you looking at us for? I'm not going out while it's raining, Lithmanar said as he turned and walked towards the living room. Neither am I, Jordan spoke, heading into the basement, unquote. Amazing, just simply amazing. What a total piece of shit Lewis is. Like, really, what a total motherfucker. Especially the comment about Lithmanar 
his mom and dad like oh you're like too mean to him bro they literally abused him and killed his girlfriend what a disgusting thing to say especially because lewis had the power to do something about that situation and chose to do nothing then throwing all that shit in endo's face despite him being the one to encourage her back in the day about doing that whore shit but you know what just because a character is kind of a piece of shit doesn't mean that they are automatically bad even if they're the protagonist in fact this total breakdown honestly made me feel like lewis the author was done playing around finally allowing his flawless little gary stew to not only lose but ultimately be disgustingly flawed in this moment of weakness and not in the usual way where everyone just suddenly falls at his feet and allows him to win the argument there was, for once, actually no winner in this argument. Just hurt feelings, bruised egos, and terrible, terrible words. Though I will admit it is a bit disappointing to see that all of, uh, Lewis's friends just immediately fall apart the moment he's not around. On one hand, it's kind of realistic since he literally solves everyone's problems, but on the other hand, it also follows through that same mentality that he is the only one that can save everyone, and they're all worthless without him. So, a bit of a double-edged sword with that one, I suppose. Something further reflected in the paragraph after this one. Quote, It was all over for him, but he simply didn't care anymore. Lewis fell down in the street as the rain continued to let small drops of water descend and drench his form. The colder air would probably get to him next. He figured, but it didn't matter to him. His optimism was dead now, torn from him like the left arm that Varric had sliced off. The images of how he had become handicapped in such a matter haunted his bewildered, traumatized brain. Some small part of him continued to keep searching for that small twinkle of light. The spark of optimism that would inspire him to do great deeds and be the superhero that he had convinced himself he was, but it found nothing. It came to Lewis then that his religious and philosophical ideas of free choice were self-destructive for him. He had chosen to go back to Earth instead of trying to stay on sin to help the people they rebuild. He had chosen to engage Varric instead of fleeing or planning out a logical strategy other than being an arrogant, pig-headed teenager. And he had chosen to speak harsh words to his friends and family, the people he relied on for love and support. His attitude had cost him everything now, and he didn't have any hope left to call upon. And so, he simply allowed the rain to fall around and on top of him, while he remained on his back. His eyes were closed, too tired to keep open and focused. It was too much for him all at once, so he just waited for the inevitability of his death to come. It was even more than just a little sad for him since he knew he would never again see the people he cared for but at least maybe Varric would leave them alone for the first time since he had begun his journey on sin Lewis Williamson surrendered it was the end for him at last and for a moment he even saw some clarity in everything he had done every snotty remark every rude comment or boisterous outburst against what he considered right or wrong were judged sentenced and appealed in his mind but it wasn't for him to worry about anymore since his battle was over. All of a sudden, the rain stopped hitting Lewis's face. He slowly opened his eyes, confused, since he could tell the rain was still pouring down everywhere else. With his tired eyes open, Lewis could see a figure standing over him. Much to his surprise, it was the old man from the antique shop where he had first obtained the Linkaran gauntlet. He was holding an umbrella over both his own form and over Lewis's upper body. The man sighed softly and pushed back his glasses onto his face, shaking his head down at Lewis. He then reached down, offering his hand to help the boy up. Lewis considered it for a moment, wondering if it was worth it all to try to keep on fighting, especially with all that happened. Within a few seconds, his mind just shrugged and said, what the hell, and promptly allowed himself to reach up with his right arm and get alongside the old man. Come along, Linkara. You and I have a lot to talk about, unquote. Ending the chapter out, and yeah, overall, I really like this chapter. I thought it was pretty well written and felt honestly pretty invested in the story at this point. There's an actual threat for once, everyone is at their lowest, and for once it can't all just be simply solved by Lewis being overpowered. I also like that the novel calls Lewis out on his behavior and how he is being extremely fucking pathetic and even some of his past actions being pretty pathetic like again leaving for Earth instead of trying to help Sin rebuild and 
you know, get rid of the king and stuff like that. I can only hope that my investment is not once again punished by book's end. Chapter 13, The Break 2. So this chapter sees a few very big developments. To start, the antique shop owner is revealed to be Thomas, and he is like an immortal disciple of a great king from many, many years ago. He's the one who wrote the Linkara prophecies back on Sin, as a matter of fact, and it is also revealed that there have been many Linkaras before Lewis too, always chosen by him to fight evil. The gauntlet then built and maintained by him and imbued with the power of angels as angels come in the night to imbue it with their, well, the magical power, I guess. Thus, the angel's armor. And while Lewis is being handed all this lore that I pretty much just summarized right there, Endo is in Theros City, sort of like sitting on top of a skyscraper by herself thinking about shit when she is suddenly visited by a certain light-bringing superhero. Quote, you know, there are safer places to relax than this. Endo looked up and gasped, leaning back in shock. A man was floating in front of her and smiling, his arms crossed in front of him. His hair was short and artificially blonde, his skin Caucasian and a little pale. The upper half of his face was covered in a white mask that hid his features along with lenses that protected his eyes from being seen. He wore a costume that mixed white and black, the fabric itself looking like sweat clothes. Endo slowly regained herself and moved closer. My apologies. I just, I never expected anyone else to be able to fly, she stated. Likewise, it's not every day that I see a woman with fur. If I may ask about it, the man queried. I'm an Anako. I believe the word that you people have as an equivalent is cat girl. I am visiting your world, although I'm not sure how for how much longer. My name's Endo, by the way. You actually seem quite calm considering I just told you I wasn't from your world, she answered, pulling out her hand to him. The man smiled and took it, shaking it gently. Mine's Lightbringer. As for not being surprised, well, as you've noticed, I can fly, so I'm not exactly unfamiliar with the unusual. Lightbringer sat down beside Endo and hung his legs down over the edge, like her, as she looked at him, smiling as her eyes brightened up. Oh, I've heard of you. You're the world's first and only superhero, she stated. Lightbringer nodded. That's me. Now what's up got a lovely woman like you so melancholy? You weren't exactly looking at things down there like you wanted to be there. Endo looked back down at the people, down into the streets. This world was not what I was expecting. While I have lots of pride in where I am from, I expected this place to be somehow better than mine. It hurts inside to think about this place. Earth is technologically more advanced than mine, but the morality is the same. There's too much evil, a lot of ambiguity, and not nearly enough good. She turned her head over to the Lightbringer and frowned. I've done a lot I'm not proud of, Lightbringer. I've done shameful things, and things that I wish I could have taken back. For some reason, I expected a lot of those feelings to be gone when I came here, but it's just the same if not worse. Because those aren't feelings you can get rid of. Our emotions are part of who we are, and while some people say it's rational or logical to deny them, the truth is that how we feel is every bit a part of who we are as our appearance and how we perceive ourselves. However, that doesn't mean you have to be mired in them all the time, Lightbringer replied. How do you mean? Well, think about it. You can't tell me that this place has been that bad, has it? Indo winced. My beloved had his arm cut off here. Then he said hurtful things to me and his friends because of his rage and grief. Do you still love him? Of course I do. Then it shouldn't matter. Couples have fights all the time, Endo. And usually it's because of misplaced feelings. He's in pain because of losing his arm. But that pain's not necessarily going to last. If you don't feel you can handle that pain alongside him, then you have every right to leave him. Otherwise, you can help him through it. Be the light in his life that makes it so that it doesn't matter what he's lost as long as he has you. All that matters is that he loves you and you love him. If you come out of a verbal argument with something better than what you started with, then you've really got something special. Of course, if he's abusing you physically or emotionally, dump his ass and it doesn't matter what he thinks, like Bringer advised. He has never harmed me, even when I have harmed him. Endo turned her head to the Lightbringer, still frowning. And what about the world? Loving one person will not change the nature of this
this place. Lightbringer got off the edge and floated in front of Endo. You see this city all around you? Endo blinked, looking at Lightbringer, as if he were insane. Of course I see it. I'd have to be blind not to. You know about its reputation? How much crime and corruption that there is? Endo nodded. Well, I'm going to save it. I'm going to make this place the best city in the world to live in, and it doesn't matter how long it takes for me to accomplish that goal, and it won't be easy. Men and monsters will try to stop me, and they'll tell me the same things you're saying about the world, that it's corrupt, it's hopeless, it's a dark, dismal place that will probably sooner destroy itself than be saved, but I won't believe them. Why not, Endo queried. Lightbringer leaned in and whispered into Endo's ear, because I wouldn't be a good guy if I let evil be right. My love for this place is the catalyst for changing how it is. If I didn't care about it, I couldn't do a thing to help it, but I do, and now I'm taking action the best way that I can. But what about me? I'm not a superhero like you. Maybe not. There was a world before I became a superhero, and there will be a world after I'm dead. Everyone has the power power to change the world, be it actual physical change or how we can view it, Endo. The world is what you view it to be. I was once told that the world is a place for the dominating and the dominated, and I refused to see the world that way, so I didn't allow the view to alter mine. The world is painful, there is no denying it, but I don't think that's the only thing about it, even in light of all the evil in it. So I bolster the good while defeating the bad. I fight to bring the world to where it should be. It doesn't matter if I actually succeed. I live my life as if the world is a place of goodness, to show it that it can be a place of goodness. Endo raised an eyebrow and recalled Ted's words, speaking them softly. You forced the world to make sense. What was that? Lightbringer asked, not hearing her whispers. She paused for a moment and then smiled. She jumped off the ledge and began hovering, leaning over and giving Lightbringer a kiss on the cheek. Thank you, sir. I believe I have what I need. She spoke before flying away from him. Lightbringer blinked for a moment, then smirked and put his hand on his cheek where Endo had kissed him. I tell you, Hannah, only in this city, unquote. So yeah, overall, pretty interesting scene. And, uh, I think a pretty good introduction to the Lightbringer as a whole and his philosophy on the world and what have you. Anyway, meanwhile, meanwhile, White Raven and Thesia go to fight Varric, but, um... Well, let's just say they get their asses handed to them and leave it at that. Meanwhile, 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 uh, Thomas says that he should be able to upgrade Lewis's armor to help him have a better chance at fighting against Varric the Destroyer. But it will take some time, and they have precious little of that. So in the meantime, he hands him a duffel bag full of guns and other such goodies to help defend himself the best he can while he goes about upgrading the armor. But this also means that Lewis will not have his protective armor to save him. So he's going to have to use more than just pure brute strength to live and last a little while longer and help protect his friends all while only having one arm. So the stakes and uh, threats are pretty high at this point. All things set up for the big grand finale. Chapter 14, Calvary. So to summarize this chapter pretty quickly, Basically, Lewis gets back home after, you know, being encouraged by Thomas and blah, 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 blah. The armor's going to be upgraded, that sort of thing. And he quickly apologizes to everyone, and they just sort of are like, yeah, that's fine, Lewis. Uh, we got Varric the Destroyer to deal with, so, you know, it's fine. It is handled a little bit too quickly, in my opinion, and... I do kind of wish that there was more drama in that regard, but whatever, they gotta deal with Varric. And that's when White Raven comes into the house and is all beat the fuck up. She proceeds to tell them about how Varric has a plan to bring the darkness back using the Black Oracle book. And he plans on using Thesia as a sort of sacrifice to the uh, book to bring back the darkness. So Thesia is actually kidnapped at uh, the place that Varric is held up currently. So that means they all have to come up with a plan quickly to take care of Varric, save Thesia, and make sure the darkness doesn't come back. Which, just in the nick of time, a uh, fucking friend the co-poet comes in and they all go outside and there is like a bunch of FBI agents everywhere. And this is because Alice, the co-poet, is in cahoots with the fucking FBI. This apparently happened because she hacked into the FBI mainframe or fucking whatever, and instead of, like, taking her to jail, they're like, oh, well, you know, you're pretty good at hacking, little miss fucking 15-year-old. You want to work for the FBI? Which I think is, like, child labor or some shit, but, um, yeah, regardless, though, uh, she decides, yeah, I want to work for the FBI, and so, yeah. 
kind of a little bit of a stupid plot point overall, but whatever. And so then they decide to come up with a plan that semi planned off the page. But it's clearly going to involve them all helping with the help of the FBI as well and the Lock Manwo spell too. Meanwhile, Varric the Destroyer has Darkbringer leave him behind to go and spread evil and the influence of the darkness in Pharaoh City. So that way, even if Varric should fail tonight, the influence of the darkness will live on. And since that's the city where Lightbringer takes place, well, you can imagine the Lightbringer going against the guy called the Darkbringer is kind of an obvious thing. So now it's everyone versus Varric, the stage all set for the grand finale. Chapter 15, Dark Beginnings. So in what is a um interesting creative choice, this chapter is entirely the backstory of Varric the Destroyer, his origin with joining the darkness, why he's so dedicated to it, and also kind of his own edgy manifesto on why he hates women. Women. No, for real, it has kind of been hinted at that he's not the biggest fan of women throughout these novels up until this point, but now we realize through this chapter that he really, really fucking hates women. This is My Twisted World by Varric the Destroyer. Quote, And I may fall into oblivion if I should fail. Nothing else matters anymore. Only resurrecting the great darkness. When I think of his glory, his absolute magnificence, it makes me want to smile and be joyous. But I restrain myself, knowing that those are the things that no servant of the darkness should ever allow himself to experience. And yes, it's himself. I never understood why the darkness would ever allow women to be part of his plans. They are vile beings to the last one. Everything about them implies weakness. They are no better than breeding horses, to be used only to produce more warriors for the darkness. Blood Raven betrayed the darkness, ideals first. I don't understand why the darkness didn't see that her weakness was because of her femininity. Of course, I was but a simple soldier in those days. I dared not question the darkness or his ways. I believed in equality for all under his rule, regardless of gender or species. I said once that in shadow, there is no gender or distinction amongst us, but blood Raven was the first sign. She showed what happens when you let emotional creatures like women enter into perfection. They betray it. I despise Mira as much as I despise her now, but for different reasons. Back then, other than being a woman, I had only one other reason for hating her. But now, after the darkness gave her back to her emotions as a way of ensuring that the other Dark Knights need not feel jealous of the elite horsemen of the Armageddon. She has become a power-mad dictator who embraces her restored happiness and laughter so that she might drink and whore herself out to make up for lost time, while also trying to dominate anyone and everything she can get her hands on. She became psychotic and lustful, giving in to her pleasures and desires, instead of just doing what the darkness commanded. In that respect, I suppose, I'm satisfied that I was never chosen to become a horseman of the Armageddon. Of course, at least Mira had some semblance of sanity within her during the first time I met her. The next woman I had to be partnered with had her senses knocked out of her long ago. She'd laugh a deep, throaty laugh and I'd cringe. It wasn't even a natural laugh of ha. For some reason, she'd do it slowly and it sounded more like ha or ho. The darkness had given me strict orders not to harm her until Grit Snack was resurrected. But now, I so wished I could have silenced her by jamming my sword down her throat. Instead, I just had to stand idly by while she smugly stood in her red armor, laughing insanely at our enemies when there was but a simple sign of defeat on their part. She couldn't succeed in even killing one of them, and yet she always stood confidently. Thesia the Conqueror, I hated you from the very moment I met you. So you're the famed General Destruction, she had said to me smiling, smiling. She was always smiling. My name is Varric, woman. My nickname is Destroyer, but you shall address me as General or Sir. Sorry, can't do that, Varric. I'm afraid I've no desire to be under your command. I am here merely to assist you in the darkness, where you failed. But perhaps you and I could get a little more 
acquainted with one another later, she said, wrapping her arm around my shoulders and looking into my eyes with lust. Filthy cow! Just for that, I should have cut her stomach open with my blade. Women are whores, and all they crave is sex. Every woman I've seen or heard about has been like that. It was always like it from the start, from the very first woman I ever had to the misfortune of meeting. Veryl, darling, go into the other room. Mother has to help some of her friends out. I was never really a child. I know that now, and I'm glad I never was. Children are taught to believe things contrary to what the nature of things are. They're taught light and told to embrace it instead of giving in to darkness, the natural state of things, until light perverts it by revealing the ugliness behind it all. It's why my mother never whored herself out at night and always kept the candles on in her room when she brought home friends. I stood in the other room, listening to her take multiple men into her room at night they use her and discard her after an hour whenever i ventured into her room afterward she was a drunken wreck her body covered in whiskey and other liquids she was so inebriated she couldn't even open her eyes sometimes i prop her up so she wouldn't choke on her own vomit after a few years i finally asked myself the all-important question why bother let her destroy herself or better yet cleanse myself of her and eliminate her sickness from my life I did it after one of her sessions. The men left. I went into her room like I normally would. She was a little more conscious this time, much to my surprise. But she was in no state to fight me off. I took one of the kitchen knives, one of the ones I had used to make my own meals since I was five years old, and plunged it through her heart. I'll never forget the look in her eyes. After I had done the deed, she simply stared back at me as if she couldn't contemplate what I had done and why. Would she have even comprehended what she had become and what she had done to me? Unquote. So yeah, Varric really, really really fucking hates women. And uh, after this, he goes on to say how he left into the world and to find his own meaning and whatnot, and that's when the darkness came to him in his time of need to give his existence meaning and all that kind of shit. And how he loved the darkness and how the day Lewis Linkara killed the darkness there was a hole deep inside him that he was never able to fill since, and how if he can't kill the Linkara tonight, he's ready to die. Chapter 16, The Way of the World 3. So here we are at the grand finale of the novel, and the series in general, I suppose, starting out with Varric and Thesia having a discussion. Tell me, Destroyer, what makes you think any of this is going to work? Thesia grinned as she looked at, over at Varric, tilting her head ever slightly to the left. It was the only movement she was capable of making thanks to the bindings on her, keeping her firmly attached to the spire of the landmark center. Varric ignored her as he looked to the Black Oracle, reading the next part of the ritual to bring the darkness to life. The first part had been completed. Blot out the sun in order to prevent sunlight from eliminating the newly formed mass. You can't possibly believe this is going to work, can you? Even if the Linkara and his companions don't slice your throat, the military of this place will surely not allow the darkness to form here and have its way. Have you seen the weapons these people have produced? They can level an entire city with the drop of one explosive and leave it uninhabitable for years. I hope your new darkness enjoys its precious few minutes of life before it's eradicated. I would think that dying once would have already softened your tongue, woman. Yet, you still seem devoted to smacking your lips together until my ears fall off, Varric finally replied, not taking his eyes away from the Black Oracle. Thesia arced her neck back slightly and laughed wildly into the air. Varric narrowed his eyes and slowly turned them towards his captive, reaching slowly for the knife hidden in his gauntlet. Thesia stopped laughing and kept her eyes focused on Varric, seeing what he was starting to grab hold of. So, Destroyer, still not cracking a smile, are we? He queried. Varric winced and held the knife in his hand, gripping it tightly. It, it is getting rapidly difficult to keep myself from controlling the emotions of happiness and joy. For example, I gain immense pleasure from the image of carving your innards from your stomach, Thesia smirked, and your hair is now blue. Missing your god that much? Varric turned to Thesia and held the knife to her throat, pressing the edge gently into her skin. The darkness shall purge these horrid imperfections from my being and restore me to my natural state. It's a pity you can't watch his resurrection, 
but your blood will be necessary for the Varric the Destroyer! Varric shifted himself away from Thesia and walked to the edge of the roof to see who had called out his name. In the streets below, the FBI cars had all stopped and taken positions around the landmark center. Dozens of agents were aiming assault rifles up at the roof, taking cover behind their varicules as they all tried to approximate the best shot necessary to hit Varric from their places. Alice stood in front of the other FBI agents, with a megaphone in her hand, aiming it up at the roof so she could speak to Varric. You will surrender immediately, or we will have to remove you by force, she called out through the megaphone. Varric merely glowered back at her, making no move to do anything else. Lewis got out of the car and ran over to Alice, asking for the megaphone. He carried the duffel bag on his back, not wanting to be separated from his contents. Alice gave the megaphone to him and he looked up at the Dark Knight. Varric, it's me! Your mortal enemy is here! What's the matter? Are you finally afraid of me? Unquote. But they all have a plan and set in motion as Lewis is spellcasted up onto the rooftop where Varric is. And no armor no less, since it's currently being upgraded as I noted before. Meaning Lewis can't use brute force on this. He's gonna have to be more cunning than that. And so the two have a conversation about emotions, happiness, etc. Lewis landed softly on the rooftop and smiled at Varric, whose spell faded as soon as Lewis had arrived. Varric turned away from Lewis and back to the Black Oracle, flipping his pages as he readied the next section of the spell. Lewis put down the duffel bag and sat down, continuing to grin at his opponent as he unzipped the bag itself. So, no threats? No exclamations about how I'm weak and the darkness is great and all that? He asked. There is no need for it. The darkness will tell you himself before he squeezes the life from you and spills your blood on the streets of this perverse world. Varric answered softly. Oh, is that so? How do you know I won't stop you? Lewis questioned. Varric turned around, pointing his knife at Lewis and scowling. You? The very example of everything wrong on this planet? Hardly. I broke you before with the darkness power, and now he can do the same. I see even your vaunted armor has abandoned you, since you wear nothing but the garb of an ordinary urchin. Lewis glared back at Varric, his smile gone. And here we go again. You ranting about the wickedness of Earth and its people and how happiness and joy are self-defeating and destructive to us. The darkness removed happiness so we did not contrast it with tragedy. Without them, we had the noblest feelings of pride and patriotism through the flag of darkness. We were not taken in by childish promises of seeing the light, or that there is a happily ever after like in fairy tales. There is good and there is evil, and whoever wields the greatest might and power will be the one that wins through in the end. It's the way of the world, Linkara. Lewis shook his head and smiled. You know when I really hate Varric, when someone tells me that they didn't like that a story had a happy ending, they tell me it's unrealistic. Why is that, Varric? Why is it that an unhappy ending is, with things turning out so badly for people, more realistic? Isn't it? Lewis shook his head. Varric, there are six billion people on Earth. You're telling me that more often than not, lives end in unhappiness and tragedy? I can't believe that. You see, I believe in those childish things that the darkness abandoned. I believe in happily ever after. I believe in the power of love and hope and dreams, even if everyone else is outgrown them or discarded them as childish novelties. There's nothing funny or corny about cliched concepts like believing in hope or thinking that the worst of situations will get through somehow. People die, of course. That's an unavoidable consequence of existence. But death after a lifetime of happiness, or average happiness, is not a death made in horror, pain, or tragedy. I'm an optimist, Varric. Which is why, even after everything that's happened, after you've beaten me twice, even cut off my arm and made me unable to wield my own armor, I still have faith in my ability to beat you. Maybe it's insanity. Maybe even it's childish foolishness. But may God have mercy on my soul if I let you have the world you want. Where darkness encompasses our vision and, and hate is a superior emotion to happiness. And even if I'm wrong and you kill me today, my world will beat you. Because the way of the world is not tragedy, but triumph. Varric's lips almost began to curve into a smile, but he managed to restrain himself. He crossed his arms and raised an eyebrow in curiosity. And what are you going to use to beat me, exactly? You have no armor to fight me with, no sword to wield or axe to cleave. 
You're just a boy. Lewis grinned and narrowed his eyes. No, I'm a boy with a friend who just took your magic book. Varric's eyes widened and snapped around, gasping in shock as he saw the Black Oracle gone. He heard a whistling sound to signal him, and he immediately turned, his sight towards a building across the street from the landmark center. White Raven stood on its rooftop, holding the Black Oracle in her hands, with an arrow shot into it attached to a rope. She smiled and waved the book at Varric. Varric, in his anger, looked back at his enemy, who stood up confidently with a double-barreled shotgun aimed right at his chest. And I'm a boy with a gun! Unquote. However, it takes a bit more than a gun to kill Varric, because the guns that he had in the duffel bag, for some reason, have rubber bullets instead of real bullets. I, I don't really know why. But anyway, Lewis jumps off the building at this point to get away from Varric, who is swinging his sword madly at him, and then the FBI agents open fire while Endo begins casting a spell. Quote, The FBI agents all began to shoot at the landmark center's roof, hoping one of the bullets would hit Varric. Varric himself turned to Thesia as she formed her sword from her hand, but she moved too slowly. Varric reached out and grabbed Thesia by her neck, breaking her concentrations and disrupting her ability to summon her own weapon. As bullets flew through the air around them, Varric held Thesia up by her neck, his fist glowing with blackened energy. Thesia kicked him as she felt him squeeze, desperately trying to get out of his grasp. Die, witch! And behold, sweet oblivion! Varric growled. The glow from Varric's fist encompassed Thesia's body as she screamed in pain, feeling as if her entire body was burning. White Raven's eyes widened from across the street as she saw what Varric was doing, and quickly brought her bow and arrow to bear. However, despite her trained speed, and skillful precision, he was too late. Thesia's body vaporized along with her armor. Two seconds after, White Raven's arrow bounced off of Varric's armor. White Raven stood in stark horror as she saw how coldly and easily Varric had eliminated Thesia, but it quickly turned to anger as she held the Black Oracle in her hands." Unquote. Yeah, that's right. Varric just straight up killed Thesia. But remember, she's supposed to be like an all-powerful Void Lord, right? Well, yeah. Again, keep that in the back of your mind a bit longer. At any rate though, Varric cast a chaos shield around himself so the FBI agents can no longer have any chance of hitting him with bullets. And then all hell breaks loose when he flies down to Jordan and Lithmanar and starts to fight them head on to protect Indo as she continues casting her spell. However, Varric pretty easily dispatches Lithmanar and Jordan, not killing them but knocking their asses out. And that's whenever White Raven gets the idea to imbue magical abilities onto Ted, Trevor, and Mandy, and Alice and uh, give them magical abilities, which they then get all based on, like, stuff from their personalities. Uh, notably, Alice the co-poet gets the ability to travel through technology, which she can't use in this battle at all, so it's kind of dumb, but she is a superhero character in the Lightbringer comics, and I guess this is the origin point of her getting those magical abilities. And so then they all comically fight Varric for a while and he's kind of like surprised that they are suddenly with powers and so he's taken off guard. But again, he is then quickly able to uh, dispatch them, knocking their asses out quickly after uh, the sudden shock of them using magical abilities. It's all a pretty funny scene and a kind of inventive use of magic on the spot. But then the upgraded gauntlet is finally delivered to Lewis, who is in quite a lot of pain from jumping from a building just a few minutes ago. And the upgraded armor is described as, quote, the side panels and the underside were silver instead of the full gold as before. And it looked as though much of the metallic paneling of the armor itself had been changed in design, in addition to a blue jewel that was equipped at the end of the gauntlet, where the elbow would be located." Unquote. With that, Lewis calls out to Varric, who had just got done beating his friend's asses and was getting ready to kill them, but now his attention is fully onto the newly armored Linkara. And what's more is the armor is able to actually rebuild his arm. So now he has both his arms again. Quote, Lewis sent the mental signal for his gauntlet to cover his body, but it felt different than the previous times. As if the armor was renewing him somehow, he shuddered as he felt the nerve connections starting to form again in his left shoulder. And he looked down to see flesh growing out from the spot where his 
arm had been cut off, pale skin coating the newly formed muscle and bone. After the hand itself had finished forming, the armor followed suit and created the mere copy of his right gauntlet over it. There were pockets of silver incorporated into the new armor, particularly in his abs and along the underside of his circlet and along his legs. Lewis held his rebuilt arm up and extended the blade out, his wings flowing out from his back as he looked from his blade to Varric. Groovy, Lewis said proudly. Varric aimed a glowing hand at Lewis, a ball of dark energy rocketing through the air at the Linkara. Lewis's blade extended from his right arm and he slashed up at the ball as it came in range, dissipating it with ease. Lewis ascended into the air as Varric came running at him, his feet soon leaving the ground to follow Lewis. With both blades extended, Lewis flew right at Varric, ready for the final confrontation." Unquote. They then proceed to have a big final fight, again the pros being a fair bit tighter for this final fight, and by the fight's end, they uh, eventually end up in this building and and um, in the scuffle, the entire building collapses down on top of them. And while Lewis's armor is able to protect them from the debris, Varric is uh, not so lucky and ends up being cut up, impaled, and lay there dying now, thwarted. And thus Lewis and Varric have their final conversation. Quote, Varric sighed and swallowed. A bit of blood was dripping from the tip of his lip. It seems you have won. You are indeed a skilled fighter boy. Or you just have incredibly bad luck, Lewis responded. Much to the surprise of the growing group around him, Varric smiled and laughed into the air, sighing as he looked up at Lewis with tired eyes. So this is elation. It seems I need it to feel better about this. I think I'm dying, Varric spoke. Save your strength. We'll take you to a hospital, Lewis said. Varric shook his head, still smiling. No, no. I do not intend on making myself a prisoner of this place. I am dying and will soon be free from this horrid world. So it's over? The last of the darkness gone? Endo asked. Varric laughed maniacally into the air. Over? Gone? Stupid girl, it is only the beginning. Even now my disciple, the Darkbringer, heads to your pharaoh city. He will bring the world of the darkness with him and it shall spread. The glory of the darkness shall enter the hearts of the people and you will see yourselves for the evil that you are. The darkness will live on, and where I have failed, he shall succeed. And before you go rushing to rescue your precious wicked world, I have even better news, O oh, Linkara. Do you recall Mira? The vile witch has been very busy back on Sin before he became convinced that he could bring you to join us. The darkness plotted and planned, looking for every single weapon he thought capable of destroying you. His storehouse and arsenal still exist, and Mira is going to take every weapon there and slaughter you and every other Linkaran to cleanse Sin. Behold, Linkara, darkness shall triumph! Varric chuckled and laughed letting loose a torrent of joyous emotion to compensate for the immense pain he felt from his body. For a few seconds, the group just stared at Varric as he laughed, but eventually the sound faded and Varric closed his eyes, dead. The group exchanged glances, all slowly looking to Lewis. Lewis crossed his arms and glared down at his dead nemesis. Not today, unquote. Ending the chapter on that note, and a pretty good note at that. For once, I feel like it was a pretty satisfactory finale as far as final battles go. I like that almost all the characters got a chance to shine and fight slash help against the foe, instead of it all kind of just being Lewis doing all the saving and defeating. Also, in a kind of a bit of a clever bit of irony, the thing that ultimately kills Varric is his own destruction as he uh, destroys the building and it comes crashing down around him. I also like the inventive use of magic and just overall, it was a lot more interesting than the previous three books finale wise, especially the third one. Overall, not too bad. Chapter 17, wonderful. So in short, this chapter sees everyone celebrating the victory over Varric. Everyone is happy, apologies are handed out, that sort of thing, but also reveals a big twist that Thomas, the man in charge of the Linkaran gauntlet and 
what have you, was actually once a brave knight of the legendary King Arthur, and the king that originally enlisted him with this goal in mind to build the Linkaran gauntlet that would be imbued with Angel's armor and what have you was all under the command of King Arthur. The book ends with Lewis deciding that he's going to go to Pharaoh City to go and take care of the Darkbringer, most likely with the help of the Lightbringer, and then go back with his friends in the Land of Sin to probably take care of Mira and rebuild Sin into Camelot. That being the note that the series overall ends on. Well, if it wasn't for the epilogue. Epilogue. So, this final epilogue sees Mira plotting shit, and basically, she casts a spell to unveil that the Darknesses has, like, this ultimate true weapon, which is an evil gauntlet that basically is, like, instead of angel armor, it's, like, the demon armor. Um, to oppose the Linkara gauntlet, which I guess is kind of cool, but obviously this plot thread amounts to nothing since this is the last book, but yeah. Meanwhile, we finally see the big twist with Thesia. That being, whenever Varric killed her, it sent her into this void space of sorts. True darkness, I guess one may call it and made her essentially not exist in any part of time, but also sort of exist in all parts of time, thus explaining the stuff that she does in the other books. But I thought she was friends with Lewis. Well, she was, but eventually she sort of sits there just by herself, hoping that Lewis and friends and all the people she met along the way would come and save her. But that never comes, meaning that, in her mind, they moved on without her, leaving her truly and utterly alone. So, left her own devices, she begins to kind of go crazy and extremely vengeful. And through sheer force of will, she is eventually able to kind of escape this void, but not really, through transferring her existence on into other parts of time and essentially becoming a master of this void, being able to use her magics in very specific and interesting ways here, and vows her revenge against the Linkara, and to find out the truth about the angel armor and where it gets its power, that sort of thing. Making this whole thing kind of like a big time loop of sorts, which, again, all of this sounds very interesting. It sounds like it would have amounted to a very interesting villain with a lot of, like, void, time travel -y shit, and was clearly set up to be the next big major villain and concept, but once again is left behind entirely because, well, this is where this series ends. So, overall, my thoughts on this last book is that it is a serious improvement over the last three books, and I was actually pretty invested overall in what was going on and the general drama there within. It does help that this book is a fair bit shorter and just much more tightly paced than the last three books, but overall I just found the use of characters and even rants to be more interesting, and it felt like Lewis was starting to actually kind of get a grip on how to write more interesting engaging scenarios. Is it perfect? No. Is it amazing? No. Is it even that great? Not really. But is entertaining and actually much more competent than the last works? Yes. Yes, by quite a bit in my opinion. Which means this series ends on a pretty high note, all things considered. But it is also a bit of a sad note in that so many interesting things and concepts ultimately left behind. Maybe it's Stockholm Syndrome, but I did actually kind of get invested in some of these characters and stories by the end. And I think there is, without a doubt, so much charm throughout the series, even if there is also a lot of bad there within it as well. On the whole, I'd rank the last book the highest of the bunch. The third would have been the second highest, and I guess overall content-wise it's the second best, uh, but unfortunately it has that really dumbass ending, which makes me want to place it in third behind the first book, since at least the first book it didn't piss me off by ruining Lithmanar and completely blue-balling me with the finale. And then in last place would be the second one, uh, simply because honestly it's just the most boring one of the group in my opinion. Outside of like two rants, the rest of that book is kind of just a blur. With that being said, I guess this ends the Angel Armor book series retrospective. It uh, took a long time to put this all together, but now if anyone ever is curious about these books and what content they hold, they can come to this video series and learn all they want about it. Even if this is a more niche curiosity for many, at best, I'm happy to have reviewed these books and presented them all to you, as well as take a look at what young Lewis's creative works were like before going into the uh, deeper dive into the 
more recognizable stuff from Lewis, like The Lightbringer and, of course, is atop the fourth wall series. But with all that being said, let's do one more fun little thing, shall we? With so many plot threads left unanswered and concepts left behind, I decided to put some of these concepts into ChatGPT and then edited them some to my own ideas and what have you for a final note to end the series on. That way there's a little bit of randomness mixed with my own specific stuff and I think you'll probably recognize the parts where I uh, took creative liberties. That being said, what would the plot of the fifth and final book for Angel Armor be? Even though I'm pretty sure there would have been much more than five books, I feel like there's probably going to be like seven or some shit. But let's just pretend there's just one more after this. Well, to start, I imagine the conflict with the Darkbringer and Pharaoh City would have been handled in the Lightbringer comic and not in the books, and ultimately end with Lewis and the Lightbringer teaming up to defeat the Darkbringer, more than likely. Thus, starting the fifth and final book with them all going back to Sin. Then, according to ChatGPT, as well as my own creative additions, quote, In the realm of Sin, where darkness and magic intertwined in a delicate dance. Louis Linkara gathered by his party of friends for a quest of utmost importance. With the fate of the world hanging in the balance, they set forth on a journey to confront the malevolent dark witch Mira and her dreaded demon armor that threatened to plunge the land into eternal shadow. Leading the charge was Louis, his angel armor pulsing with ancient power as he marshaled his companions. White Raven, whose arrows always stroke true. Lithmanar, a master of thievery and a skilled fighter. Jordan, a stalwart keen warrior with fierce skills. And Endo, a cunning and powerful priestess with magic beyond comprehension. Together they braved treacherous landscapes and faced countless perils, their bond of friendship serving as a beacon of light in the encroaching darkness. As they neared the heart of Mira's domain, the air grew thick with malice and the ground trembled beneath their feet. At the gates of Mira's fortress, the party stood united, their resolve unwavering in the face of adversity. With a mighty battle cry, they charged into fray, clashing with Mira's minions, that of orcs and other creatures that she twisted to her will through the power of the demon armor. Within the depths of the fortress, they confronted Mira herself, her dark magic swirling around her like a shroud of despair. Clad in her demonic armor, she exuded an aura of pure malevolence, but the heroes stood undaunted, their spirits bolstered by their shared purpose. The battle that followed was fierce and unforgiving, a clash of steel and sorcery that reverberated through the halls of the fortress. In a climactic showdown, the heroes emerged victorious, their combined strength proving too much for Mira and her foul machinations. With a final desperate cry, she is vanquished, her demonic armor shattered, and her dark reign brought to an end. By none other than the very cat girl that she once beat and abused and raped, Indo, dealing the final blow, once her armor was destroyed and smashing her face in with her boots, leaving Mira a disgusting mess of blood, bone, and broken teeth, still barely alive to slowly bleed out as they left her to rot, the orcs coming in to dine on the rest of her flesh, them no longer being under her influence. As the dust settled and the echoes of the battle faded, the heroes emerged from the fortress, triumphant, their hearts filled with pride and relief. But their journey was far from over, for now they faced the daunting task of rebuilding what had been lost. With Lewis at their helm, they set to work on restoring Camelot to its former glory, their efforts fueled with their shared vision of peace and prosperity. And as they worked tirelessly to mend the wounds of war, a new era dawned upon the realm of sin, guided by the light of hope and the strength of friendship. And in the heart of it all, Lewis the Linkara stood as a beacon of leadership, his crown a symbol of the enduring spirit and unity that had brought them all together." Unquote. And so that's how the story ends. Until, twist, there's either a sixth book or this book has several more chapters left in it, and there's now a time skip with Lewis and Endo married with a kid, Luthumnar having taken his sister away from those evil parents of his, all living within Camelot, but all now fully restored. But then the world starts to slowly break apart, people disappearing and falling into a void space of sorts. And that's when Thesia finally comes into play. But this conflict cannot be solved by any mere simple battle, for there is yet another twist. Quote, As the crown king of Camelot, Louis the Linkara found himself faced with his greatest challenge yet. Alongside his steadfast companions, White Raven, Endo, Lithmanar, and Jordan, he stood ready to confront the enigmatic lord of the void space, Thesia, whose blonde hair shimmered like golden flames against her crimson armor. Thesia had long been a mysterious figure, her motives obscured by the shifting sands of time and the depths of her own realm. 
But now, as she threatened to pull everything into the void, Lewis and his friends knew they had to act swiftly to prevent catastrophe. With a powerful incantation, Thesia whisked them all into her realm, where time and space danced on the whims of her will. Reality itself seemed to warp and twist around them, as they found themselves standing before the imposing figure of Thesia, her gaze like a stormy sky, promising destruction. But, as Lewis and his friends attempted to reason her with her, through both words and might, they discovered a startling truth. Thesia's actions were driven by more than malice, but by a newfound sense of purpose born from Lewis's arrival in the realm of sin. It seemed that Lewis's very presence had set in motion a chain of events that threatened to unravel the fabric of reality itself, just as the Linkar prophecies had predicted. He might have brought happiness and prosperity to the world of sin, but ironically, he is also his death, the Linkar's ultimate fate to become a beacon of light from the darkness, so great that it brings about the heat death of the universe. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Lewis knew that mere words would not be enough to sway Thesia from her course, but even though she wanted to stop now, this was far beyond her to stop the void from consuming them all now. This was fate, and so with a solemn determination, he made a bold offer. His own armor, imbued with the power of the Linkara, to bolster Theseus' strength and grant her the ability to hold back the encroaching void, thus making her the next Linkara. With a hesitant nod, Thesia accepted Lewis's gift, her form shimmering with newfound energy as she became the final Linkara, existing simultaneously in all time yet not at all. With her newfound power, she stood as a guardian against the void, her will holding back the darkness that threatened to consume them all. However, in order for her to truly become the final Linkara, Lewis would need to die. He would need to cease to exist entirely, and thus after his final good buys and final words to everyone he touched in his journey, who he loved from sin and earth, Lewis falls into the void willingly, with both his and Theseus' sacrifices becoming like that of the sun and moon, light and dark, the gravity of the universe. Indo goes on to raise their child into a brave man, just like his father. Lithwinar protecting his sister in the new capital of Camelot, White Raven preaching the words of the Linkara and all who would listen of both his and Theseus' sacrifices for them all, and Jordan hooks up with Lithuanar, a brave general now for Endo's kingdom as queen, and they all lived happily ever after. The end. So yeah, that was a mixture of chat GPT and my own ideas. Is this what was going to happen in the final book slash books? Uh, no, no, probably not, like at all. But hey, they don't exist, so my little fan fiction is just as valid as any other, I suppose. But with all that being said, I think it's time we get out of the pages of these books and onto the web pages of The Lightbringer. And that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so very much th for watching through this video. I hope that you've all enjoyed this journey through all of the Angel Armor books and are now all very excited to jump into the world of the Lightbringer webcomic and of course, atop the fourth wall, the video series. There's still much, very much, Linkara content to cover, so get ready. All that being said, I want to make sure I give a quick shout out to all of my loyal patrons and channel members. You guys helped me out immensely in keeping this channel going and these big massive projects all worth doing, at least financially speaking, including all of my night eggs and my night owlets, as well as a very special thank you to my great night owls, Hexmaniac Hannah and Ho Hot, and a super duper special thank you to all of my arch owls, including the wise Nicodemus, talented Cherry and GT, the good Chi Vibe Zen Garden Party, the daring Daniel Petrie, the Super Saiyan Star Punch Gaming, the mysterious Mr. Gaming Sheep, the fearless Forgotten Ace, and the Supersonic Sword. Thank you all so, so very much for the continued support, and to everyone watching and who happens to subscribe and like from this video. But until next time, this has been Dylan the Night Owl, flying off.